everything rolls back to the Fed and their super aggressive policy last year. The Fed's conviction around bringing inflation down to 2% is very clear. I've been thinking of a fun word to describe this is slowflation, slow growth and inflation that's still going to be more stubborn than you would have liked. The Fed will have to keep interest rates higher for longer in order to get inflation back to the 2% target and maintain it there. Before the end of this year, we will be at a level that's pretty consistent with long-term inflation expectations that the Fed wants people to have. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. We start this morning with some breaking news. President Biden launching his re-election campaign. The president making a formal announcement for a second term. Get ready to hear this slogan on repeat. Quote, <clears throat> let's finish the job. The Biden team releasing a highly produced three minute long video and here's the quote from the president this morning the question we are facing is whether in the years ahead we have more freedom or less freedom i know what i want the answer to be and i think you do too tom this is not a time to be complacent the president goes on to say that's why i'm running for re-election elections are domestic but there with the freedom or less freedom it does allude to one of the foundational parts of any president's term the surprise of foreign affairs and to me more, more freedom or less freedom speaks to his foreign treatment with the war in ukraine he says there is still work to do to give Americans a, quote, fair shot, Lisa, and beat back extremists in the Republican Party who want to cut government spending and curb abortion rights. You get the feeling already early on that this is going to be a key feature of this campaign. And it has been working very well in terms of getting turnout, in terms of uh, galvanizing voter interest in this. I have to say how different this is than three or four years ago when he was launching his uh, presidential campaign and he was really <clears throat> a laggard in the whole race. People didn't really pay attention to him until it seemed like he was the most plausible uh, candidate to go against uh, former President Trump. Here we are just the only one, really, in the seat. I mean, there's nobody who's viable who's contending against him, yeah. already the oldest person ever elected to U.S. president. And here we are. He is the main standard bearer for the Democratic Party. 560 days to the election and along that way, particularly for our international audience, John, there's two elections here. There's the primary battle, the Republican primary battle. They're out of office. And as Lisa alludes to, will any Democrats stand up and run against an 82-year-old Election Day president? And I don't see evidence of that at this time. We'll talk to Anne Marie Horton here later in the hour and a wonderful guest coming up momentarily. But, John, I, I just I, I really wonder how the Democrats coalesce around him given so many in the primaries would be more to the left than Joe Biden. He is 80, as Lisa indicated. He's already the oldest U.S. president ever. He would be 86 at the end of his second term. Tom, you and I were talking about the polls, the latest poll from NBC News. This one, 70 percent of all Americans, including 51 percent of Democrats, don't want Biden to run for president right. in 2024. That is the elephant right. in the room. It, the elephant in the room, and it's very different. I have the clearest memories of a Sunday evening when Lyndon Baines Johnson said, I'm not going to run. And that stunned the nation, John. This is in the middle of Vietnam. This is completely different. And as you say, there's a huge doubt about the age. I should also point the age of Mr. Trump is an issue as well. And nearly half of those respondents in that poll, Tom, citing his age as a major reason yeah. for that. If you're just tuning in on TV and radio, some news coming in. As expected, we've been talking about this for a number of weeks now. As expected, the president launching his re-election bid, the president making a formal announcement for a second term. I've said this a few times. There is a quote in here that we've heard a few times over the last couple of weeks. This quote, you're going to hear it on repeat. Let's finish the job. Joining us now to discuss, Greg Vallier, Chief US Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. Greg, let's finish the job. Your thoughts, your reaction to this one? Well, two things. First of all, a lot of people don't like the way the job has been handled so far. So to continue a, a policy that voters aren't crazy about is, is, in my opinion, risky. Second point is, by having a tape, you avoid any chance of a gaffe, anything spontaneous that would perhaps uh, come back against him. So that was, a, I think, a safe right. move to unveil it in this format. Greg Vallier, those of us of a certain vintage, I put you in this group too, Mr. Vallier, right. saw yeah. the deterioration of, in all good ways of Ronald Reagan into his second term 
and of George Bush Sr. We lived that. We didn't live Woodrow Wilson. Explain to me the wear and tear on Biden and where you perceive he will be physically and linked to the job, not at Election Day, but how about a summer day in 2026? It's a terribly stressful job, as you know. And the fact that he could still be president at the age of 86, to me, is mind-boggling. But it's worth noting that Donald Trump turned 77 later this spring. So it's not as if uh, it's just one old candidate. It's two old candidates. The tradition as well is to move vice presidents around based on the politics of the moment. If he's running, he has to redo with the Harris of California or for someone new. What is your research on that? What are your thoughts? has to be Harris. I can't see anyone new. I'd be shocked if that happened. Two of the biggest constituencies for the Democrats are African-Americans and women. So he's going to fire an African-American woman. Not going to happen. Can you talk to us, Greg, about who's going to lead this campaign, who's going to run the campaign and how much daylight there might be between this campaign and the one that the president ran back in 2020? I noted with some interest, John, that the the woman who's going to be heading the campaign is Hispanic. If you look at the weakest area of the uh, the Democrats' coalition right now, it's Hispanic voters. So that could be a pretty shrewd move. Greg, I just want to build on some of that. In the last campaign, the president basically ran a campaign that was a referendum on Donald Trump, the former president. Do you think he's going to have the same luxury this time around? Maybe not. He's got a problem he's got to deal with, and it's not age. It's an economy that is starting to soften, as you guys have been reporting. It's an economy in which inflation has not been subdued. Those are huge issues that he has to deal with. Greg, as we take a look and start the ramp up here of the election cycle, I have to ask, what does it say to you that we have uh, two people who are established political figures who are highly polarizing in some manners and they're not popular in terms of people wanting them to run again. What does that say about the state of politics in the United States right now? Yeah, I joke, Lisa, that the, the front runner right now is none of the above. And it, it is a real problem to see that. I still think there's room for a couple of new faces. There's rumors this morning about Tucker Carlson. I think that's pretty far-fetched. But uh, Glenn Youngkin, the governor of Virginia, has not totally closed the door. He's in Taiwan this week. He's been getting a lot of campaign contributions. There almost has to be some new face over the next few months. Well, you brought it up, so let's go there, Greg. Uh, some of the shakeup that we've seen over at Fox News and Tucker Carlson out and some of the lawsuits that we've seen recently. We've seen on both sides of the aisle a lot of uh, castigations around highly polarizing rhetoric that is now coming into fire in a legal space. How does that shift the nature of this election? If there was no Trump, I think Tucker Carlson would be a, one of the front runners. But there is a Trump, and I think that Trump will continue to get most of the Republican base. But you wonder with him as well if maybe he peaked out in his polls over the last two or three months. And I, again, I would just reiterate, I think there has to be room for at least another fresh face or two. What would those fresh faces look like, Greg? Where would they come from? Who would they be? Maybe Nikki Haley's campaign catches fire. It hasn't yet. Okay. Uh, maybe Tim, Tim Scott of South Carolina. Uh, there are some other people in the Republican Party. For the Democrats, I mean, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and um, Marianne Williamson are not serious challengers. I can't see anyone serious like Gretchen Whitmer uh, coming in to challenge uh, Biden. I, I think he's got a pretty... Path. Greg, before we go, the heart of the matter here is this centrist Democrat. Let's remember, Greg, he was born the day the Russians went after the German Eastern Front in 1942. The heart of the matter is the liberals have to show up for, for a blue-collar guy from Scranton. That's the image. This time around, will the liberals show up? I think that's a very valid issue. A lot of young people are really upset over Biden's decision to open up Alaska to oil drilling. I think that could be a, a big problem for him. And as I mentioned, Hispanic voters are wavering as well. So the, the traditional Democrats, the, the traditional liberal bloc is showing some cracks. Greg, just a final word on the Florida governor, if you can. It feels like to me that people are running him off before he's even announced that he's going to run for president. Greg, I just wonder what your reaction yeah. has been to that over the last couple of days. Very good point. I think it's way too early to write him off. He's got a ton of money. 
He's, the base likes him. Uh, he may have to become a little more likable. Uh, he may have to work on his rough edges, but there's a long way to go, and it's too soon to say he's out of the picture. We're all working on that, Greg. Greg Valier okay. of HF Investments. <laughs> likeability. Greg, thank you. You know, it's an ongoing process, isn't it? It's a lifelong pursuit. <laughs> I hear that of every being day. liked. The latest news from the president, President Biden launching his re-election bid, the president <clears throat> making a formal announcement for a second term. We've mentioned that phrase a full time a few times. So let's finish the job from the president of the United States. Going for a second term, Tom, we talked about the elephant in the room. He is 80. If he secured a second term, he would finish that term at 86. And the, and the, the thing important here at six o'clock Wall Street time, and John, for our international audience, what's so important is the single statistic, 560 days to the election. I don't think there's any other equivalent on the planet. And this is, by every opinion I've seen, a grind and witness the video today and not a public announcement. Is he up for the grind? I think in the immediate weeks, that will be the key, key issue. Anne-Marie, down in Washington, she's going to run to the studio. We'll catch up with her in about 20 minutes time. We've got to catch up with some of the price action as well. The equity market negative 0.5% on the S&P 500. Stock of the morning so far has to be this one right here. First Republic, negative 20 We'll do a full recap of the earnings for you. Tons coming through this morning and after the close a little bit later. But Lisa, we've got to start here. This stock, down 20. Yeah, and taking down some of the other uh, regional banks with it, given the fact that it came out already very suppressed expectations and came out worse than people had previously understood with respect to deposit outflows, with respect to their plans going forward, cutting 25% of the staff. What is the path forward for profitability, let alone survival? What is that path? I look for the chart. The chart's not good. This 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 is not another day of down three bucks or whatever. This print this morning is is something. It's not that anybody expected. It. I think a lot of people, frankly, expected it. But it's really important where the stock is. This it morning. Deposits were much lower than expected, as yeah. Lisa indicated. And I go a step further on the earnings call. Didn't take questions. That was really a red flag. Analysts did not like that at all. Oh yeah. Didn't take yeah. questions on the earnings call. Yeah. I think it was about 15 minutes long. That's not what you want to see when a lot of people want some big answers to some tough questions. We have to step lightly here. We don't want to, you know, incite things or just go off the news. But the silence on this matter is important. Down 20% in the pre-market on that stock. We'll catch up with Christopher Maranak of Jenny Montgomery Scott on First Republic in just a moment. Your equity market's negative 0.5%. The latest news this morning, President Biden launching his re-election bid. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo well as you've been hearing here on surveillance president biden asking voters to let him quote finish his job the president has formally announced that he would seek re-election next year in a video released today he said there was still work to do to give americans a fair shot the president criticized what he called extremists in the republican party who want to cut government spending and curb abortion rights Shares of regional bank First Republic plunged in pre-market trading. The bank's quarterly results reignited investor concerns about prospects for its business. Customer deposits plummeted 41 percent in the first three months of the year. The figures underscore that First Republic is still contending with the impact of last month's regional banking crisis. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is refusing requests from fellow Republicans to change his $1.5 trillion debt ceiling proposal. Bloomberg's learned the bill will be sent to the floor for a vote this week under a rule that does not allow amendments. Now, if as few as five Republicans oppose the measure, it would be defeated. In Sudan, the two sides battling for control of the North African nation have agreed to a ceasefire. The Sudanese army and the rival Rapid Support Forces are backing a 72-hour humanitarian truce. The army says it was brought about by U.S. and Saudi mediation. And PepsiCo is forecasting organic revenue for the year that beat estimates. The beverage and snack company also posted first quarter sales and profit that was better than expected. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
live from New York City. Welcome to the program. Here's your equity market on the S&P 500. On the S&P right now, negative 0.5%. Some earnings disappointments out there that we can recap in just a moment. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 0.4%. The Russell getting hammered this morning. We're negative 1.2%. Let's wrap things up at a bond market for you. Treasuries shaping up as follows on a two-year, down about three basis points, still just about north of 4%. The story yesterday, one read on manufacturing in this country, just a bit softer than expected, bringing yields lower on a 10-year, down about five basis points. Your 10-year yield this morning, 343 72. The news this morning, 30 minutes ago in Washington, D.C., the President of the United States releasing a three minute long, highly produced video. The headline, pretty simple the President launching his re election bid. Let's finish this job. I know we can't because this is the United States of America. There's nothing, simply nothing we cannot do. President Biden making a formal announcement for a second term. Joining us now in Washington, D.C is Anne-Marie. AMH, walk us through this one, widely expected for a long, long time. Yeah, widely expected, but here the president is laying down the groundwork, saying officially, I will be running for 2024. It really starts to put a damper on some of the whispers that people were asking within the Democratic Party. Is he too old? Should we look for someone new? The president saying, I want to finish this job. That's how he ends this video that he released today. And also, this gives him now a moment where he's going to be having events. He can meet with donors. It can really start to put his campaign team together, which they yeah. also released a statement looking at who is going to be on the national campaign team and who is going to lead him into 2024. And what this looks like it is setting up to be is a Biden-Trump rematch. If you look at who is winning right now in the Republican race? Emory, what's so important to me is he's got to meet with donors, meet with this, meet with that. Does he want to meet with the left? Does he want to meet with a huge part of a Democratic Party to the left of Joe Biden? I think this, this is a president who is going to want to meet with everyone as he goes into 2024. He needs every single Democrat, left or right, to vote for him uh, in the, the next general election. And what you saw in 2020 is this is a president who had to really lean into some progressive values and items on the left that they really want to see through. Things like climate change. This was These are things that we're able to get youth voters out in large numbers. Student debt relief. These are talking points that the president is going to obviously need to have. We want to make sure he picks up those votes. Do we have a sense of how important it is for uh, President Biden to get reelected to see the economy continue at pace, that sort of the economic growth can't necessarily face some of the uh, vast consequences that people have been talking about for him to get reelected? Well, the economy already is going to be a huge issue going into 2024. So while the president announces his 2020 race, we heard from the RNC, and this is what their statement was. I'll bring you a bit of it. They say Biden is so out of touch um, that the, after this current crisis after crisis, he thinks he deserves another four years. And one of the first things they talked about in this statement from the RNC was inflation will continue to skyrocket. So you can already see the Republicans are trying to make the economy the front and center issue. But that also is easy for them, right? Right? Because at the moment, a huge issue that Republicans are really struggling to have a singular united message on is abortion. That's something the Democrats are really trying to harp on. Amory, one other thing that stands out for me is this poll from NBC News. Tom and I were talking about it a little bit earlier on this morning. 70 percent of all Americans, including 51 percent of Democrats, don't want Biden to run for president in 2024. And the reason nearly half of those respondents cited his age as a major reason. Yeah. And Marie, what is his message to those people that ultimately, even within his own party, didn't want him to run? Well, Biden continues to say that I, you all had doubted me in the past uh, and you were all wrong and I plan to prove you wrong. He constantly says that when you ask him questions about his age or any other issues about whether or not he is able to continue on and take on a second term. Also in that poll, though, I think it was very clear that most Americans don't want to see another Biden-Trump rematch. They just want fresh faces all around, although the sizing, uh, the sample sizing of that poll was quite tiny. But I think what you see a lot of times in these polls is that they are looking uh, overall, when you look at moderates and independents in the country, they do want new faces. But when you look at hardcore on either side, they're happy to really go with their current leaders of the party. I think for the Democrats, it's more that they just don't have 
a working bench right now, someone that could really take over the mantle and win in 2024. So they want to stick with Joe Biden, who, who you know, they counted him out as well in the last primary, and then he was able to rise to the top. I think for the Republicans, the situation is obviously a little is different. Trump has a major hold on the party, 30 percent, but is he able to win a general election if he was to become the campaign? Because obviously he's proven in the last cycle that he was unable to do so. AMH, thank you for the wrap. The wrap-up down in Washington, D.C., off the back of the headline that the president's made a formal announcement for a second term. We'll catch up with MH a little bit later on this morning. We've got tons of news on the earnings front, tons of news. I want to start with UPS. They've come out just moments ago this hour saying that annual sales will come in at the low end of its guidance on the back of slowing U.S. retail sales, weighing on demand for package deliveries. This stock, Tom, in the pre-market down 5.6%. Huge indicator for me. I'm watching futures overall. SPX futures negative 22, down half a percent right now. I would say the basic theme this morning, John, and the many earnings coming out across all of what I'm going to call working America, away from fancy tech, away from the banks, is guidance lower would be my theme. Job cuts too. 3M, Lisa. This one just crossing. 6,000 jobs to go. Yeah, and also it's similar to what we saw over UBS, full year adjusted EPS coming in on the lighter expectation of what people were like expecting out there. Here's the question. These are the bellwether nuts and bolts of the economy. How much do we end up seeing an ongoing softening? Because it's not just UPS. FedEx shares also falling in pre-market trading and sympathy based on the fact that UPS sees fewer package volumes, especially coming from Asia, and not necessarily seeing the same kind yeah. of profitability, a real bellwether company at a time of real uncertainty. Let's fold this into strategy. I should note uh, 3M with a completely unacceptable 3% annual return over the last 10 years. Joining us now, the strategist Jeffrey Yu of BNY Mellon. Jeff, let me go into you on a broader economic question. If we're seeing earnings would suggest guidance tepid, are you modeling recession around your arch strategy into uh, this year and next year? Um, yes, um, but only a mild one uh, for the U.S. Um, at that. Uh, and on a global basis, I think the jury's still out. You know, looking at what's going on in Europe right now, they're certainly not looking at recession as a base case. Um, China is um, reopening slowly at a slower pace than expected. Uh, but having just returned from Asia, I think the sentiment is pretty robust out there as well. Uh, so uh, the age-old age story, of course, if the U.S. is um, starting um, some sniffles, you know, it's the rest of the world. You're going to worry about catching the cold. Well. Jeff, it's interesting to me that within the equity market in the United States, tech is outperforming, but Europe is outperforming the United States. Can you make sense of those two things? Well, I think tech outperforming, uh, that uh, could be, you know, forward expectations and forward easing expectations um, coming through. If we go back to last month, you know, some of the best days for tech um, were when um, uh, Fed cuts as early as June uh, were uh, priced in. So I think uh, that relationship you know, between financial conditions and tech, we need to look at as well. Europe's point of view, what's surprising is, you know, this year the European household has done very, very well. Uh, and now with wage settlements coming through in Germany, you know, perhaps uh, the spending power would be greater. And if we can get a tailwind from Chinese industrial demand further down in the yeah, I think there's every reason to, uh, for Europe to be a bit more uh, optimistic. But of course, don't worry about the U.S. side of things as well. Jeff, is that the elephant in the room, though, that right now China actually isn't accelerating as much as people previously thought, that we've already priced that all in? And you're starting to see that on the margins, whether it's what UPS highlighted in their earnings or whether what we're seeing over in oil demand? Uh, well, the issue is, and the National Bureau of Statistics highlighted this in the Q1 numbers, two-thirds of Chinese growth right now is in consumption. Um, so Chinese and eating out and um, increasing expenditure on experiences, you know, doesn't do much for U.S. freight companies, right? Uh, but if that can translate in the next quarter or two you know, into investment demand, you know, for the third of the economy, which isn't growing right now, to start to pick up some slack, you know, then I think conditions can stabilize uh, uh, as well. Uh, but then China will be looking at the U.S. if they're looking at the global economy. Will Chinese firms expand uh, rapidly as well? Well, will they invest them in size? I think that that's the open question right now. Jeff, just a final question from us. Favourite idea right now for you and the team, what is it? Well, I think favourite idea and a relative value, and we like Euro crosses, Nilo. We're looking at Euro yen heading into uh, this week's BOJ decision of Governor Ueda's you know, first uh, press conference, you know, first decision, you know, any surprises you know, out of there. Valuations wise, I think now that Europe has um, turned the corner, maybe um, we will you know, get some uh, uh, during earnings reports. Will they start to worry about earnings translation and like that? But as far as the ECB is concerned, they don't mind a stronger Europe. But overall, look at Europe, we'll look at relative value, and we think Euro on the crosses a bit lower. Uh, those are the trades we're looking at. Interesting. Jeff, thank you, sir. As always, Jeff, you there. If BNY Mellon.
wrapping things up in the market. We need to talk about the broader market. We're down by 0.5% on the S&P 500. We need to talk about the earnings. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. A UPS out with earnings and guidance a little bit earlier this morning in the last hour saying that annual sales will come in at the low end of its guidance as U.S. retail sales slow. That stock is down by 5.6%. And then literally just moments ago, more job cuts, not from tech this time. Tom from 3M, 6,000 jobs to go. Yeah, I wouldn't conflate them together. UPS is a bellwether like FedEx. It's a real tone on the logistics of America, the pulse of America. 3M has been a management train wreck for well over 10 years. They have just, it reminds me of Campbell's Soup, where it's an iconic product that can't get out of its way. And I would say, John, it's been, I don't know if it's 42 or 47 restructurings over a decade. The way I look at this, it's another 6,000 jobs as they try to find out the Minneapolis mining and manufacturing future. Nice. Nice. Otherwise known as 3M. Stock is up by 1.8% in the pre-market. That's the latest from 3M and UPS a little bit later today after the close. Lisa, we'll talk about Google and Microsoft onto Wednesday, Meta, Thursday, Amazon and others. On to next week, Lisa. Apple just around a corner. And this comes after they really fueled most of the gains that we saw so far year-to-date in the S&P. And so at what point is the bar set so high for this year of efficiency that has to be really efficient? And that hinges on an economy that on the margins looks like it's showing cracks. And that's what we're seeing in some of these earnings, whether it's UPS or 3M with cost-cutting. This is not simply hoarding labor in a pandemic. This is a different nature, as you yeah. both pointed out, yeah, really well of job-cutting. So given this sort of drumbeat, how does big tech come in here and show that they could still grow? This line from 3M sees the second quarter continued consumer-facing end market weakness. More weakness through the second quarter. Tom, that's the call from, from 3M this I, I morning. Think the guidance is light this morning. It'll be, you know, you see this 10, 20 companies. What do the next 50 look like? Sure, it's true. We need to talk about UBS over in Switzerland. We'll catch up with Manus Kranich in just a moment. And in the next hour, we'll catch up with the General Motors CFO, Tons to talk about with him a little bit later. Your equity market, negative 0.5%. Yields down five basis points. Your 10-year, 354. The latest out of Washington. The president officially launching his re-election bid. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Joe Biden has made it official. He's running for re-election next year. The president made his long-awaited announcement in a video today asking voters to let him, quote, finish this job. He'll face a Republican field dominated by his predecessor. Meanwhile, economic uncertainty will cloud his case for a second term. China's President Xi Jinping efforts to portray his country as a peacemaker in the Ukraine war have been undermined. Now Beijing is trying to extinguish a firestorm caused by its ambassador to France. Liu Xie questioned the independence of the former Soviet states, echoing Vladimir Putin's views. Beijing said that was a personal point of view and reaffirmed respect for the sovereignty of countries that were once part of the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, the British government is set to unveil new legislation that could lead to a crackdown on Silicon Valley. Big tech firms such as Google and Meta Platforms face more oversight and fines of up to 10 percent of global sales for practices that hurt consumers. The legislation would create a digital markets unit in the U.K.'s antitrust regulator. UPS is out with a full year outlook that was weaker than expected. The package delivery service says that volume in the U.S. was lower than expected due to a slowdown in retail sales. UPS also says it faced demand weakness in Asia. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. of uh, distress in the market. Generally, the first quarter was very challenging. We still saw clients uh, uh, looking at UBS as a safe haven. Uh, and uh, uh, the inflows were coming in from all regions uh, and uh, from different sources. And uh, in, in that sense, uh, we are very pleased that, uh, particularly also after the announcement of the transaction uh, of the acquisition of Credit Suisse, we still saw inflows coming into 
uh, our bank. So a sign of confidence of our clients. UBS CEO Sergio Aramotti speaking with Bloomberg's Manus Cranny. We'll catch up with Manus in just a moment. UBS reporting the weakest quarterly profit in more than three years. The stock a lot softer in Swiss trading earlier on this morning. At the moment, the broader market negative 0.5% on the S&P 500. On the S&P, we are a little bit lighter. Tons of earnings out there. UPS, the guidance at the low end of its previous range. That's disappointing investors this morning. 3M with some job cuts, 6,000 to go. That's uh, improving investor appetite for the stock, just a little bit up by 1.8 percent or so. And then after the close, a little bit later, it is on to tech, Tom, in a big way. And John, I, I brought up a random screen on the Bloomberg, and there's many ways to look at earnings, folks. And I really want to partition this, John. I brought up an optimistic screen about the present earnings, this, this, beat, beat, gain, guide, higher, that. But then you bring up a guidance screen, and it's completely the opposite. Cut, 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 cut. It's always about guidance. And, and there's a real partition today. Look, the Federal Reserve is struggling to provide much guidance. I think it's very difficult for the C-suite to do the same thing. What was interesting about these UBS numbers, and Manus has got far more depth on this than I have, it's interesting how they played down some of the inflows into the bank. <clears throat> yeah. Played down the idea that it came from Credit Suisse played up the idea that it came from elsewhere. Yeah. What's interesting about this, and Manus and I and all of us have had this conversation, so many of those Credit Suisse clients also had a relationship with UBS. And Tom, how they manage that relationship now it becomes a combined entity is going to be interesting. So when we think about who wins, who wins? The US wealth management players? Right. Who's going to be the winner here? The winner better be the domestic people of Switzerland because I thought it was a hugely choreographed set of headlines. I mean, this thing, every drop of the headline was massaged around their present strategy. I think it's interesting. They brought out, brought in Oliver Wyman, you know, Dan Tannenbaum. Sure. With Hugh von Steenis uh, driving that ship with his work with Governor Carney. This is a high-level consulted merger to appeal to the Swiss people. Top line here, a lot of new money from rich clients pouring into that bank. Yeah, and there it is. And there's one headline that sticks out to me, and it's the only headline for me to talk to Manus Cranny about. Ensconced in Zurich with the Bloomberg News Job of the Week Award. Is Manus Cranny here yesterday over his left shoulder Credit Suisse, over his right shoulder UBS today, only the Union Bank of Switzerland behind him. Manus, there was that single headline which strategically is what everybody wanted to know, and it was simple. The combination is an equivalent of seven to 10 years of gathering of assets. Did that surprise you to see how much they brought in and got a seven-year jump on getting bigger? Tom, thanks for picking the headline because it defines the current undervaluation of the equity of UBS right now. Look at the 30-day chart on UBS. Let's see if we can bring it up because therein lies the point. This market has yet to see the real material improvement that Armadi, Kelleher and Khan can deliver. Now, here's the rub. $28 billion came in. $7 billion of that in net new money came in after the deal had closed. That is point one. But to your point, Jonathan, the United States of America, the Americas brought in $8 billion of the new money. You had your own banking crisis. Sorry to sort of reawaken those fraying nerves that you have. You had your own crisis, and the American clients ponied up for the net new money. Now, you shouldn't have been able to drive a wheelbarrow past Credit Suisse, load it up, jump the tram, up you go, and wallop it into UBS. That didn't materially happen thus far. There is a caution and a reticence. And, of course, it played to Armadi's tune in the interview where he said, well, Manus, of course, this goes to show that there is healthy competition on the street and that this concentration risk argument is perhaps a little bit overplayed. He had guardrails up, and I think he was very cautious about the buyback and the timelines and trying to push him on what would be a measure of success. It was back to the UBS blueprint, Tom uh, and Jonathan and Lisa, which is, I've done it before. I've got a roadmap. I know what I'm doing, and I know where I'm going. But, Manus, you raise a good point, and John was talking about this earlier, this idea of the flows not coming necessarily from Credit Suisse, and that being played as a good thing. When is that a bad thing? The fact that if clients have their money in both UBS and Credit Suisse, they will want to diversify their potential risks. They will want to diversify their money managers. Absolutely, and hence the reason why I take a four... Thank you. 
That's the reason why I take a four-hour train journey to Frankfurt and see what flowed into Deutsche Bank. Don't forget, Ollie was with me. He said Deutsche Bank tanked by 15% as this deal uh, was being done and there was carnage on the street of Bahnhofstrasse. You know what? Will you bear with me? Because I want to give you a little bit of math. Buffers matter. What have we got? They paid $3.3 billion for $50 billion of equity. AT1, slap it in. You've got $63 billion where you can book losses and write down assets and losses and write down assets and tank a few businesses. Then you've got $5 billion of your own. Then you've got $9 billion from the state. It's a long, long way before you encroach into a negative number of words. This deal does not stack up. Buffers matter. Marion Hayfler is writing the story as we speak. And when you stack up those numbers, you begin to really understand just how much they have got on side before they really take any pain. Go back, listen to the interview. There's a couple of lovely nuggets. I love this deal. And when it comes to downsizing the bank here in Switzerland, he said, I'm glad you met a lot of experts, man. It's telling me how to actually run a bank and how to renegotiate the contract of engagement. That was the only sort of sense of, ooh, a little frustration. Manis, it was a great interview, and congratulations on it. I do want to just push this forward. There was a sense of trying to expedite at least the closure of the transaction. Do we have a sense of how much they would like to expedite the actual uh, integration of Credit Suisse in light of some of these concerns, in light of some of the investor worries? He just would not be drawn. You know, so how quickly, you know, did Kelleher set a low bar three years to four years to do the deal? He pushed back on that slide. He managed, and actually off camera, he, he just said, Look, you've got to understand. He said, normally he said, you go dancing with a potential partner for two months, he said, before you perhaps court them properly. This was done in the space of two to five days, depending on whose reporting you listen to. I think it's sort of post haste, post, and, and uh, it's almost post the deal, the real understanding begins to come. In terms of downsizing and integrating and bringing that investment bank back to 25% of the size of the overall institution, I think it's very clear. He made a very nuanced answer. There's a demographic here in Switzerland, people are getting older. Natural attrition is going to be part of the narrative that they play out to us in terms of downsizing the Swiss unit here in Switzerland. But I've been with Armadi for nine years through the transition at UBS. This is not a CEO who dallies around. He decides, executes, and delivers. And capital, capital is the key, and he wouldn't be drawn when that buyback is back. It's paused, not cancelled. Manus, you know him better than pretty much everyone else I know. Just fantastic to hear that exchange between the two of you earlier on today. World-class reporting from Manus Cranny over in Zurich yesterday on Credit Suisse, this morning on UBS, with Sergio Edamotti trying to integrate an absolute monster, Tom, in Zurich, Switzerland. We've been through this 20 years ago, 25 years ago, where it was SBC, Swiss Banking Corporation, and UBS. What they did is they kept it as they brought UBS into SBC, but they renamed it UBS. It's a little uh, confusing, but they've done this ballet before. To be honest, man has ha had my head spinning with the math. I couldn't keep up with the cranny mathematics. But the answer is they've done this before, they have the government behind them to get this done correctly. And there's yeah. a, again, I go back to what we're missing in London, missing in New York, missing in Hong Kong, which is this is a domestic roll up. I could talk about the great zombie roll up. Maybe this is the greatest zombie roll up of the year. Well, Manus framed this as a relationship. And the management over at UBS want to make out that this happened really quickly. They didn't have time to think about it. Their friends in the banking world have been playing matchmaker for five to ten years on this deal. It's not like it came out of nowhere, is it? It's like those two friends that you think should get together. Yeah, exactly. And then finally one of them is desperate enough that it has to happen. <laughs> Do you that's want to talk of, a little bit more about that's, that's, that's that? Would you like to explain I'm, yeah, not, I'm, not talk, I'm not just for the record. <laughs> All right. Please. Just for the record. All right, but just to put just, that... Just, I'll get my camera up just quickly and make it very, very clear. I'm not talking about any of my friends. None of my friends. Just... Thinking, Wait, you where know, is this? I'm getting broadly. a message right now. <laughs> I will say, though, this is the issue. They had time. The math didn't make sense, Tom. It didn't make sense to a lot of people. You know people are still trying to parse the, through the it all to understand is, it. He had a parsnip and coriander soup priced at $25. So expensive. That's the ridiculous. Zurich is like... It's nuts. Is Manus a gnome of Zurich? In the next hour, we'll talk about the earnings that have come through in the last hour. Plus, our top story this morning, President Biden launching his re-election bid. We'll head to D.C. in just a moment.
everything rolls back to the Fed and their super aggressive policy last year. The Fed's conviction around bringing inflation down to 2% is very clear. I've been thinking of a fun word to describe this is slowflation, slow growth and inflation that's still going to be more stubborn than you would have liked. The Fed will have to keep interest rates higher for longer in order to get inflation back to the 2% target and maintain it there. Before the end of this year, we will be at a level that's pretty consistent with long-term inflation expectations that the Fed wants people to have. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. If you wanted a quiet morning, you're not getting one. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tuning into an equity market down by 0.4% on the S&P 500. Lots of earnings to talk about. Lisa's going to jump in on that in just a moment. The top story, 60 minutes ago. We've been waiting for this one for a long, long time. Literally, since before Christmas, before Thanksgiving, when Ron Klain was at the White House back then and yeah. told us, after the holidays, you might get an announcement. And here we are at the end of April with this announcement. President Biden launching his re-election bid. The president making a formal announcement in a three-minute long, highly produced video about 60 minutes ago, Tom, for a second term. Yeah, it's here, but your point is really well taken, is it took a while, but yet the pros that we talked to, like Greg Villiers, like Amory Horton, said, no, this is about the right time. I think the there was a, like, let's go, let's go, and a lot of the Washington people were saying, no, it says April, and that's where we are. We'll be at the White House Correspondents' Dinner this weekend, and it will be a re-election president greeting us. Greg Valier of AGF was pretty blunt in the last hour when he turned around Lisa and addressed that phrase the president's been using lately and again this morning, let's finish the job. Are people happy with the job he's been doing? Never mind finishing it. You pointed to that NBC poll talking about how 70% of people do not want to see him run again. And I think something like 60% do not want to see the former President Trump run again. So this is a highly unpopular pairing that looks like the most likely pairing heading into election <clears throat> season with a lot of issues economically, geopolitically on the table. So here's right. the question. Where is younger other leadership and what's it going to look like at a time of such heated polarization? I agree. It's odd. And of course, we had to go back the surveillance. My interns researched this this morning, John, and we can bring it back to England. I woke up one day about three years ago and realized I knew nothing about William Gladstone. And I read a quick monograph on the great British politician of the 19th century. John, the last time Gladstone was prime minister... 82 years old yeah. in 1892. So there is a precedent here. At the end of his second term, he will be 86. Yeah. That's the elephant in the room right now. And Lisa is, touched on is. that NBC News poll within that poll about how unpopular this run might be. And I can go through the numbers and share them with you just briefly. 70% of all Americans, including 51% of Democrats, don't want President Biden to run for president in 24. And nearly half of those respondents cited his age as a major reason. This is something we can talk about with Anne-Marie in just a moment. We also need to discuss the earnings this morning. So about 60 minutes ago, we heard from United Parcel Service, UPS. UPS coming out and saying annual sales will come in at the low end of its guidance. That stock is softer this morning. Then we heard from 3M. 3M coming out and saying they're going to have to cut jobs by 6,000 cut the workforce by 6,000. So UPS is negative almost 5%. 3M is positive by 1.4%. And Lisa, moments ago, an update from McDonald's. I'm looking at EPS at 263, the estimate 231. Yeah, the comparable sales for the first quarter up 12.6% versus the estimate of 8.2%. So a pretty big beat. And this uh, follows on what we saw from Pepsi, PepsiCo earlier this morning, also with a beat. So if you're looking for themes, what it seems is the most industrial, uh, industrially facing companies are facing some headwinds right now. We're looking at whether it's 3M, whether it's uh, this idea of UPS and then FedEx, those shares following on. If you're going to eat something, particularly if it's on the lower cost end, Consumers are willing to accept price increases, and we're seeing that at McDonald's. We saw that at Coca-Cola. We saw that at PepsiCo. And this, to me, is the divergence that makes it so difficult to come up with a clean narrative about this economy. Let's wrap up this price action for you. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. We're negative 0.5% on the S&P. Yield to lower by five basis points. Your 10-year, 343.91, a break of 350 in yesterday's session. Some softer manufacturing numbers, which speaks to some of the stuff that Lisa's discussing in the FX market, just about holding on to one 
10 here on euro dollar, Lisa, even with the euro dollar negative about two tenths of 1%. Yeah, and you're looking at the Dallas Fed manufacturing data we got out yesterday. Today we get housing data like FHFA house price index uh, for February, as well as new home sales for March. But to your point, in addition to U.S. Conference Board consumer confidence for April, we get U.S. Richmond Fed manufacturing for April. That might be the most interesting based on some of the disappointments we've seen recently. Today, the earnings do continue. We get Bank United and Community Bank System before the bell. And I'm really focusing on those small regional banks. Pack West after the bell at about 4.20 p.m., following what we saw from First Republic yesterday, we're now worried about the regionals again. That seems to be the new theme, that those uh, sort of feelings of confidence that we had stabilized, perhaps taking a real test after uh, some of the results that we've gotten recently. And today, we do get also earnings from the tech giants, including Alphabet and Microsoft, in addition to Texas Instruments, after the bell. That has been what's driving the gains so far this year. Alphabet up more than 20 percent. Microsoft up almost 18 percent. How much is this a chat GPT fueled rally? Well, they give us guidance. McDonald's really didn't give us guidance forward. Uh, there was a dearth of guidance there. It'll be interesting to see the guidance off of big tech. One quick note here on the banks. You got to watch commercial real estate. I'm reading on it as hard as I can every day. Cranes is really helping me on this city to city to look at individual properties with huge haircuts on sale. It's something that Mohammed Alarian talked about last week. He said you can't call this a credit crunch. It's not going to be a broad-based I economic st contraction strongly agree. in lending. Yes. But what he does think, it will hit pockets of the economy yes. in bigger ways than others. And perhaps <clears throat> commercial real estate is a feature of that time if small yeah. banking has to pull back. Well, it is a pockets of the economy, and that goes to the political tinge here as well with the president's announcement of re-election is they, the candidates, and the two candidates to go to November 5th of 2024, they've got to segment parts of America to win. The president making a formal announcement for a second term, the phrase, let's finish the job. Let's head down to Washington and catch up with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. MH, the words from the president this morning, the question we are facing is whether in the years ahead we have more freedom or less freedom. I know what I want the answer to be, and I think you do too. This is not the time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election. The thoughts of Washington this morning. Well, I think this was highly expected. We even knew that announcement could come as soon as this week or as soon as today. Uh, this is Biden actually on the anniversary of announcing his first campaign when he won and ran for in 2020. So this has some nostalgia to it. But really what this sets up is Biden is able to get a team around him outside of the White House to just focus on his re-election, because obviously he's still president of the United States and he has um, everyday jobs that uh, the leader of the free world has to, has to get to, tend to. And also, really, this gives him a chance to make right. sure he can start talking to donors. And there's set to be a um, donor conference, if you will, likely on Friday. So this sets up him going to 2024. It also really now means that there's a lid on the whispers on whether or not Biden will run or not, even though, Jonathan, as you said, Ron Klain's come out and said it. His wife has come out and said it. Dr. Jill Biden, the first lady, they've all said he's running. Biden even told the weatherman, I am running. That was on the <laughs> Easter roll on Monday. And now he finally has this highly produced video yeah. And now the game starts with coalescing the team around him. My recollection, I'm going to go all Greg Giroux on you, Amory Horton, our wonderful guy, county to county across America. It ends up in the suburbs, I'm going to say, as a generalization. How does Joe Biden win again in the suburbs? Well, I think he's going to use a similar playbook for 2020, which is the concern about uh, the former president, Donald Trump. And this is going to be with independents and especially women. I think abortion is going to be a huge issue for women going into 2024. And we already see Republicans are struggling with how they are going to message on it. You even had the head of the RNC saying on Fox, we do have a messaging problem when it comes to abortion because they don't have a unified message. Um, that is going to be one key issue the president is going to want to talk about when he goes into 2024 and he tries to get uh, the suburban vote, especially suburban women and women in general. Uh, the other key issue, of course, is going to be the economy. So Biden is going to have to defend his record while running this campaign. And with the economy, that could be a challenging moment because obviously we've seen inflation and already this is where the Republicans want to take the debate. RNC is out with a statement saying Joe Biden wants to finish the job, but what does that job mean? Sky high inflation. That's how they are going to frame his reelection. 
How much of President Biden's reelection campaign is hinged completely on the former President Trump actually running? Because President Biden seems like, again, probably the most likely person who could beat him. So when you look at some of the polls, it does look like there could be another Republican candidate who could beat Biden. There were some earlier polls that that person could maybe be Governor Ron DeSantis, but that Biden still beats Trump. Um, so this is almost a just a rematch of 2020. And as you guys have been noting, that NBC poll, even though the sample size does look quite tiny for how many people were polled in that, it doesn't look like America wants a rematch of 2020. But where the direction of travel is, they are, it looks like they are getting it. One, obviously, we have uh, President Biden today formally announcing for 2024. So he's obviously uh, going to be the nominee for the Democrats. He's the sitting president. But if the Republican side... It is the former President Trump who is winning in these polls. And then there's a very interesting article this morning in the New York Times about the big donor for Governor DeSantis, who, by the way, is on a world tour right now and got a VIP greeting in Japan, that he is um, concerned about some issues, according to his reporting, ben, uh, um, Ken Griffin, regarding the six-week abortion ban and also DeSantis's comments on calling Russia's invasion of Ukraine a, quote, territorial dispute. So potentially you're going to start to see some of these individuals that people really thought could potentially beat Trump in the primary actually start to fade away. It's amazing how many articles I've seen in the last few days declaring the end of a campaign that was never announced by the governor of Florida. <laughs> Just amazing. AMH in Washington. Anne-Marie, thank you on the latest. The president making a formal announcement to run for a second term. Tom, it's super early days. I think a lot of people are already running away with the idea that it's going to be a replay of the rematch of what we saw last yeah, time around. Th that's a zeitgeist. No question about it. That's a zeitgeist. It'll be a rematch. But I, I'm really on the fence on it. And as we've all said here in the theme of 2023, there's so many financial narratives, market strategy narratives, and guess what? The political narratives of this nation now, I can't make sense of it. I would go one step further, even if it is a rematch. And I stress again, it's incredibly early days. Hard to make the case, Lisa, that it will be a replay of the same campaign. The last campaign was about a referendum on the sitting president, Donald Trump, at the time. This time around, President Biden has to defend his record. He can't just hide away and make it about the other guy. It's also the unspoken truth that both parties are so splintered and they're not clear how to bring some unity to either side. Equities right now, negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. The latest news in Washington, President Biden launching his re-election bid. We'll cover that through this morning for you on top of a ton of earnings through this morning and onto this afternoon. After the close, you will hear from Google and Microsoft. It's big tech's turn after the closing bell. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden is asking voters to let him, quote, finish this job. The president has formally announced that he would seek re-election next year. In a video released today, he said there is still work to do to give Americans a fair shot. The president criticized what he calls extremists in the Republican Party who want to cut government spending and curb abortion rights. Shares of regional bank First Republic plunged in pre-market trading. The bank's quarterly results reignited investor concerns about prospects for its business. Customer deposits plummeted 41 percent in the first three months of the year. The figures underscored that First Republic is still contending with the impact of last month's regional banking crisis. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is refusing requests from fellow Republicans to change his $1.5 trillion debt ceiling proposal. Bloomberg's learned the bill will be sent to the floor for a vote this week under a rule that does not allow amendments. If as few as five Republicans oppose the measure, it would be defeated. General Motors posted first quarter profit that beat estimates. The automaker also raised its full year earnings and cash flow guidance. GM's stronger results came from rising sales in the U.S. despite higher interest rates and inflation. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
think tech outperforming uh, that uh, could be you know forward expectations and forward easing expectations and coming through. If we go back to last month, you know, some of the best days for tech um, were when um, uh, Fed cuts as early as June uh, were uh, priced in. So I think that, that relationship you know, between financial conditions and tech we need to look at as well. Jeff Yu in the last hour of BMY Mellon pushing ahead to tech after the closing bow. Google and Microsoft a little bit later today. On to tomorrow, we'll hear from Meta, Facebook. Then after that, on Thursday, Amazon. On to next week, we'll hear from Apple. Moments ago, we heard from GM. Beat and a raise from General Motors. We will catch up with the GM CFO a little bit later on. That stock is higher by more than 3%, Lisa, beating first quarter profit estimates, raising full year earnings guidance. Which really shows, again, the bifurcation of the haves and the have-nots. We've seen disappointments yeah. at other auto companies. And this is sort of interesting. Who has the pricing power? Who has the dominance? Who has the, the products that people want? And who's going to emerge the winner in the electric vehicle race, given the fact that that's really in the forefront? There was someone talking yesterday from a Chinese EV company saying only 10 will emerge in this field. Uh, GM banded back to tw early 2022. It's been in a trading range and sort of on the bottom of that range and it's a nice lift up and my question John with this is use of cash given is a general statement pretty good earnings and the guidance is a little moldy ex McDonald's and a few other constructive stories but they really got to come out and state cash and UPS the big brown said we're going to continue to do share buybacks along the way one question for GM price cuts at Tesla how are you reacting to price cuts at Tesla? Yeah, I, I, what do you do? Is EV valid? I think is is where I would start with the CFO this morning. Uh, David Rosenberg channeling John Farrow uh, this morning. Give That's me the good. tweet from Rosenberg here. He's <laughs> recovering from the Montreal Canadian uh, season. Don't be fooled by a two percent print on Q1 GDP growth. More than a hundred percent of the pickup was in January. March GDP contracted as we head into Q2 momentum. You mentioned this, John, that the quarter's distorted by a bang-up January. Warmer. Much warmer than anticipated. Forgot about that, didn't we? We kind of escaped winter over Christmas and into the new year. Just escaped winter. But also, what happened to the cold weather? But also, as Blanchard says, the Biden stimulus was still there and it's drifted away quickly. Well, resilience is the word that you hear a lot this earning yeah, season. Very... Resilience to the consumer. But now we're starting to see some cracks. Jobless claims a feature of that story that I think we can point to. More broadly, though, you wake up this morning, the S&P is negative 0.5% on the S&P 500. Yields are lower by five basis points on a 10-year, 343 91. We can talk a lot about the market. We will do through this morning. We'll also return to that announcement from the president in the last hour, finally getting it done. We've been talking about this for so long, we can <clears> actually <throat> talk about it now. The president making a formal announcement, Tom, to run for a second term. It's it's there. And I think the coverage that we've had this morning is is has been great uh, about it. What does he do in the next week? I mean, you know, it's 560 days to the election. What does he do? How do you jumpstart this? Run another video? I, I, I'm, I'm curious. Go have a campaign event. I'd do some interviews. That would be nice. Yeah. Some one-on-one -on -one interviews. I, I mean, Lisa, nice you mentioned more of that. She did a video. I mean, I just, you know, I wonder where we go on this. What we're going to do is futures negative, what, John? Negative 22 we got to, negative 25. We're back to negative 18, a little bit of a lift uh, in the tape. Sarah Hunt now, lean forward on this on the equity markets with Alpine Saxon. Uh, was hugely popular because she participates in the market while others are afeared. With the guidance out there on earnings, are you afeared? Are you afraid of what's to come? I'm not sure that afraid is the word that I would use, but I'm definitely cautious given the fact that the equity market is sort of at the top of its range. It kind of got to that 4,200 level and then back down a little bit. I think we have to worry about what's coming down since most of the earnings estimates are weighted very heavily towards the back half of the year. And if you listen to people's guidance, which I think everyone's going to be doing in Q1, we want to hear about the whole year's cadence. We don't just want to hear about what happened. We want to hear about what you're expecting. And I think that, you know, UPS coming in with lighter package volume on the margin, I think the news is a little bit more cautious for that uptick in the end of the year. So have we pushed out a slow, shallow recession into 2024, or are we going to not get the pickup at the back half of the year that we're looking for? I just think that earnings estimates are not really reflecting the fact that we're slowing down as much as we are. On the surface at the index level, you indicated this, it kind of looks calm. Pretty muted price action last week through the month so far. This well-defined trading range we've all discussed around this table repeatedly, 3,800 to 4,200 year to date. Does that mask something more sinister beneath the surface? 
Well, if you look at the fact that really the top 10 stocks have been something like 80 percent of the performance of the S&P so far, and the NASDAQ is very top-heavy, and those stocks have done very well, I think underneath the rest of the S&P is up maybe 1 percent in Q1. So I think that there's definitely a divergence in the action of stocks. And those big stocks that were sold off very heavily last year were reinvested in this year very heavily. So there's you've set these big swings in these big stocks. And the question is really going to be, what are they doing with their – what are they doing with their CapEx? Are they pulling back or not? Because that's going to be a big part of the story for earnings for everybody else besides the big tech guys. And what's happening underneath on some of the things because of these regional banks? I mean, I think the real question is, is credit really going to be much tighter? Anecdotally, I've seen stories that say it's very much harder for people like property developers to get loans and things like that. I think all of those things are that slow-moving, long and variable lag that is starting to catch up. And I think that that's a little bit of a worry in terms of, the expectation that earnings are not going to be down year over year, but they're going to be up slightly. And a lot of that, again, is weighted to the back half of the year. So then when does this divergence become convergence? I guess that's one question, because you're seeing the strength in GM, for example. Let's use that as a poster child, saying that they're expecting uh, profits to increase above people's expectations, that demand in North America is still strong, and they derive most of their revenue from the North American market. So how much can you say, great, that means that things are going really well in the United States versus they have pricing power and they've managed their inventory really well. I think this is the biggest problem, right? Because you also look at sectors like the airline sector, that's doing very well because everybody wants to travel. But you have other sectors that are not performing as well. And whether or not the rest of the auto game can work as well as GM is working right now, and that's also looking behind us. What about looking forward? Can people get credit? Because a lot, but the people who don't need to get credit to buy a car can go buy a car. But the people who need credit, that's becoming a question as you look at things like Ally and other financers who say, you know, this is going to be different. We're going to pull back on credit. So I think that's part of the issue right now. People are talking about big tech starting after the bell today as possibly the bellwethers for this earnings season. Do you agree with that or do you think that it lies in the industrials or elsewhere? I think that this goes back to the fact that we have such a I mean, bifurcated is too simple because that's only two things. There are so many different actions weighing on the different sectors that it's almost like you've had a slow rolling recession in different parts of the economy since last year. So it's not like everything's going down at once or everything's going to go back up at once. You've got all these different moving parts, and some of them are doing much better than expected, and some of them are not. And some of them, when they do well, the stocks don't reflect that. Or when they do poorly, the stocks don't reflect that. So it's been a very challenging period of time because even if you're right theoretically, it doesn't mean that the market is is going to react the way you thought it would react in you know what you think of as sort of more fundamental terms. So I think that that's, that's part of why it's been such a challenge last year and I think this year too. Exxon, Friday. It's one of your favorite sectors. <laughs> Let's talk about energy. What are you looking for this week? Well, I think that you've you've seen oil prices come up, right? So that's going to help, but that's that's very recent. So was the fourth quarter was the first quarter what was the average oil price is that going to be really what are the margins going to do? You saw Halliburton come in today. Halliburton had great numbers. Use of cash, Exxon, GM, and the rest. When are we going to get some courage to deploy cash to shareholders? I just don't see it. Well, if you're Exxon, where are you going to get that courage from, right? You're basically being told by the whole world that no one wants oil after a certain period of time. Now, when that period of time is, it's going to be keep changing because I don't believe it can be in 10 years. But how I, much I, more am I going to invest? I mean, I think that's part of the issue on oil prices right now is the supply constraints because people haven't been investing. Their dividend growth is totally unacceptable. I, I mean, I, I mean, am I an old fogey on this where it's all about share buybacks and it can't be about dividend growth? Or no, money? I think you need to do both. And I think that when you do both, you telegraph that those cash flows are not temporary, that they are more permanent. But the problem for the oil companies, again, is you're being told basically by governments, we want you out of the oil industry. So how do I justify to my shareholders or to myself investing a lot of money? Now, they're doing it in some cases. I mean, again, Halliburton just had good numbers. You're going to see better numbers on the oil service side because you've seen investment start to pick up but I think that the problem for for some of those guys and for, you know right is the cyclicality so GM I've got a great year this year but if I increase my dividend I have a bad year next yeah. year yep. what do I do do I cut my dividend because people investors don't like that Sarah this was awesome it always is Sarah Hunt on the energy patch Exxon reporting later this week from New York this is Bloomberg
from New York. Equities down just a little bit. We're negative on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 2, on the S&P 500, we're negative 0.4%. On the Nasdaq 100, down 0.3%. Big afternoon coming up for the Nasdaq 100 a little bit later. Google and Microsoft reporting after the close. Lisa will go through some single names in just a moment. I would have run through the bond market yesterday. Dallas Fed manufacturing, softer than expected. That brought down yields on a two-year, right the way through the curve, actually. We're still north of 4%, but only just about on a two-year. We're down three basis points, Tom. We're back to 4.05% on a two-year maturity. And the real yield is coming in again. It's not to where I can interrupt and say this is a big deal. It's not. But the trend there changed with that economic data yesterday. Break of 350 on a 10-year, 343.72. We're down five basis points, pushing through to next week. Federal Reserve, May 3rd. ECB May 4th, going into it all. The euro just about holding on to 110 on euro dollar. We look like this, 110.20, Lisa, with negative two-tenths of 1% there, negative 0.2% going into those central bank meetings next week. And then, of course, dun, 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 the key moment, May 8th, the senior loan officer survey that everyone's been waiting for oh, all of this time. In the meantime, we have gotten a ton of these earnings that are actually fascinating. Looking at UPS, that's where I want to start. Uh, they said that annual sales would come in below uh, or sort of on the lower end <coughs> of the guidance as expected by analysts. They cited slowing demand for U.S. retail. They also cited slowing demand over in China. Those shares down about 4.7 percent. Interesting to note that those shares were up about 13 percent year to date. So an outperformer so far in 2023. But let's see how long that lasts. FedEx following in sympathy down 1.4 percent. And 3M, we've been talking about this. The year of efficiency isn't just necessarily for big tech because they're planning 6,000 job cuts. Those shares rising by 1.7 percent. But what does this say about how the nature of job cuts are changing at a time when really the way to boost uh, income is simply to increase efficiency in a new way. I'm also looking at the banking sector. We got First Republic earnings yesterday. It was really unimpressive, to put it mildly, especially given the fact that there was no press conference. Those shares lower by more than 21 percent. And then the other regionals falling in sympathy. PacWest, we're going to be getting uh, today at 4.20 p.m., 3.7 percent loss ahead of the open, 3.5 percent loss now. That was what it was earlier. I'm looking at Western Alliance as well, which already reported earnings down uh, two and a half percent in sympathy with First Republic. And then I want to say, just to finish up on General Motors, those shares popping by 3.2 percent, expecting their earnings to come in at a higher end of expectations for the full year. We're going to be speaking with the CFO, Paul Jacobson, uh, just coming up here in about 15 minutes. It'll be fascinating to see, John what he has to say at a time of so much change in the industry of pricing pressures and EVs and also potential cracks in credit that are emerging from some of these banking stress. Price cuts at Tesla. Price cuts at Tesla. First question. Did I mention First price question. cuts at Tesla? First question. Are you responding? <laughs> David Welch calls me Sitting up at 2 a.m. David Welch, Bloomberg, Detroit. Sure. If you don't ask him about Tesla, I'm never going to speak to you again. GM, every morning that happens, they're like, again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are we, chopped liver? It's like, you know, the fourth, fourth time in a year, something like that. I, it's, it's, it's Clay Christensen. It's disruptive to say. And the like, news flow is extraordinary. John, this goes all through next week. It goes well into Apple, you know, the Fed meeting. Yeah, May 4th. And then Apple, May 4th. So it's, a, it's an earnings derby here overlaid with politics and the rest. Right now, we are thrilled to bring Amanda Lynham of this head of macro credit research at BlackRock with really interesting, uh, interesting view of the credit market uh, all in all. I, I look at the turmoil out there in equities. And I want you to bring it right away over to the bond market. Are you man? Are you clipping coupons? Do you have the scissors out? Does Larry have you in the basement and you got the scissors out clipping coupons? Or can you actually manage and do execute total return in bonds this year? Right. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here with all of you. We absolutely see a really attractive opportunity in fixed income. I think Lisa, though, suggested earlier in the program, there's a bifurcation between the haves and the have-nots. And that's absolutely something that we're focusing on in the corporate credit market. I think one of the really interesting points is adjusting <coughs> to this higher cost of capital environment. And so from our perspective, the disruption in the regional banking system, um, the pullback in credit that we expect, is going to have different implications for different parts of corporate credit. Taking the U.S. leverage loan market, for example, we've seen a doubling of interest costs in four quarters. And so that's really something that I think we're paying a lot of attention to. Now, for asset allocators, you are actually getting paid a lot more for that risk. You're picking up around 200 basis points if you looked at single B loans versus single B high yield bonds. So um, there is a real relative value dislocation that you have to manage there. But that's 
that's really what we're watching going forward. I think the two things that are really important is that even a period of just below trend growth in a higher cost of capital environment should warrant a rebuild of risk premia in corporate credit. And then the second thing is, unlike the period of the past two decades, we are actually seeing some differences in the way that that stress is manifesting. So, for example, we're seeing the loan default rate outpace the high yield bond default rate, which is something that hasn't happened for most of the past two decades. We think that that will continue. We think that there will be differentiation between sectors, as even some of these corporate companies and sectors have to refinance into a higher cost of capital environment, say, in the high-yield bond market. So while we absolutely see an opportunity in fixed income, it's really important to tread carefully. We're paying a lot of attention to sector allocations, parts of the curve. Um, and, and ironically, as, as Lisa, I'm sure you well know, high-yield has actually outperformed IG so far year-to-date. So for all of the concern about downside risks to growth, we actually mm. haven't seen that manifest in the lower quality parts of the market. Jeff Gunlack, a double line, I think, said to CNBC a number of weeks ago, have you ever seen a high yield bond mature? Because they always just refinance. When they come to refinance next time around, yeah. Where is that big maturity wall, so to speak? Is it off in the sure. distance? Is yes. it close? Is it right the way out there? Where is it? It's 2025 uh, for the most part, but we know that high-yield companies typically don't let their bonds mature. They typically address them 12 months or even before, unlike IG, where sometimes they're actually replaced. They, they mature and they're replaced or refinanced with very short windows. Uh, for the high-yield bond market, we are seeing that activity um, pick up. I wouldn't say that the new issue markets have been exceptionally active, but we're definitely past the lull of March. Um, and, and really, I think that's a trend that will continue because if, if, if we're looking at kind of refinancing needs through 2025, corporates will have to start to address that in 2024. And it's not really clear to me, given some of the overhangs on growth, the debt ceiling, what will be better about the market in the second half of the year versus now. So what's the bigger risk right now? That the Fed's going to hold rates higher because yeah. of strength in the economy, that's which right. would be positive for some of the riskier credits, or that the economy deteriorates, right. that yields go in, so all of a sudden this looks like high yield, truly, and yet Absolutely. it's not really a good environment with respect to their corporate bottom line. Absolutely. I think John and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, where we kind of saw these two different paths, both of which were um, probably warranting rebuild of risk premia. The first is you have a recession, um, you have the Fed cut rates because the downturn in growth is so bad, but spreads respond to that and move wider. Or you have, on the second hand, um, maybe the bank can contraction and lending isn't so bad. Growth is below trend, but not recessionary, and inflation is still elevated and the Fed stays on hold. And in that instance, you have corporates adjusting to a higher cost of capital environment. And I think either one of those warrant a rebuild of risk premium. I think they manifest, though, in different ways. We know that the high yield market is more sensitive to downside risks to growth. And so I think that recessionary outcome would warrant a more pronounced repricing in spreads. But either way, it's challenging to navigate. So how are you allocating? Because on one hand, you are going name yeah. by name, but yeah. there has has to be a scale kind For of sure. issue here. Yeah. So how are you sort of divvying up the risks sure. at a time when you also need to rent, not yes. only just yeah. own? Yeah, we're leaning into high quality, high yield. Front end of the curve is inverted. Um, and so we're still leaning into picking up yield in that position. Um, and then we're looking to deploy capital tactically. I mean, it's, it's really uh, a lot of attention to sector allocations, idiosyncratic stories, very mindful of an uptick in distress and defaults that we're kind of managing through off of a very low base. <laughs> Uh, but we do absolutely, I mean, see an, an opportunity with yields where they are. You have to stay invested, and you really do need to um, lean into those exposures. But it, it warrants a, a lot of caution, in our view. Let's get to the topic that everyone loves to hate to talk about, <laughs> debt ceiling. Yes. You've written about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Does that apply to credit? Does that story, is that something I need to think yeah, about or it, can I avoid it? it? It does apply to credit. If we use the 2011 episode as an experience, we saw that high yield spreads widened around 40 percent. So the 500s range to the 700 range. Of course, we had an equity market decline, peak to trough over a few weeks of 17 percent during that same time frame. We <clears> also had the European debt crisis in the background. So a bit hard to disentangle the 2011 experience. But absolutely, right. I think it's something that weighs on risk sentiment for sure. 
Sure. Off, and I, off uh, your uh, remit, yeah. you studied this at Villanova a million years ago. <laughs> yes. Is there an efficacy to studying credit default swaps? I mean, they don't have the liquidity you're yeah. used to, but yeah. is there a value? The hysteria that's out there, John, yeah. in the U.S. CDS right now, is that yeah. a valid study? It's an incredibly technical market. I would say the widening that we've seen in the, for example, the one-year U.S. sovereign, it's moved from an extremely low level of 15 basis points to something around 110, Is the market deep enough? I, I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily take that as the major read. Thank you. Um, I think really the, the dislocations in the T-bill curve <clears throat> are notable. I do think that as we get closer to when the X date will be, that the market will pay even more attention to this. But to, to the point on does it matter for credit, I think it matters for risk appetite, which matters for credit and equities, but it also matters for sectors. And so there are certain sectors, certain companies that have a large portion of their revenue and earnings tied to government spending. And so if we see cuts to discretionary non-defense spending, for example, you would expect that maybe perhaps those, those budgets might be reined in. Is that weakness you would buy? I think until we get some clarity on how this how this path forward looks, I think it would be difficult to 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 get super constructive on it. I, I it's not clear to us that this will be an easier process versus 2011. Why is that? I, I just think there's there's a significant amount of uncertainty, slim margins. I think it's not clear where a lot of the party lines stand on terms of um, you know where where the obvious cuts for for spending uh, decreases are. I don't know about you, but for us, whenever we try and have this conversation with anyone on Wall Street, there's just kind of pushback. It's like, eh, it's happening. It's out there. Yep. What about you when you speak to clients? I think I think it's um, it, it, for the for the immediate. <sighs> portion of March, a lot of the focus was on the banking sector, and rightly so, downside risks to growth. I think now that we've kind of moved past the immediacy of that, market participants are looking around saying, okay, what else is on the horizon? Um, uh, certainly, though, I, I think it's difficult to have a game plan when we don't know when that X date will be, and so we're waiting for the tax receipts to see, is that early June? Is it late July? Is it later in the summer? I think once we have some clarity on that, I would expect folks to kind of focus on it even a bit more. Amanda, this was great. It always is. Thanks for being with us in studio. Amanda Linden there <coughs> of BlackRock. Bramma, you get the feeling that's becoming a bigger story slowly and then it will be um, all at once at well, some point in the summer. If you look at T-bill yields, one month versus three months, the three month is yielding the most relative to one month going back to the early 2000s. So just to give you a sense of yeah. some concern. As Amanda said, you're starting to see it there yeah. in a T-bill curve. Equity futures right now, negative 0.5% on the S&P. Up next, we'll catch up with General Motors CFO with a stock up in a pre-market market off the back of a beat and a raise that conversation next keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo joe biden has made it official he's running for re-election next year the president made his long-awaited announcement in a video today asking voters to let him quote finish this job he'll face a republican field dominated by his predecessor Meanwhile, economic uncertainty will cloud his case for a second term. China's President Xi Jinping efforts to portray his country as a peacemaker in the Ukraine war have been undermined. Now Beijing is trying to extinguish a firestorm caused by its ambassador to France. Liu Xie questioned the independence of the former Soviet states, echoing Vladimir Putin's views. Beijing said that was a personal point of view and reaffirmed respect for the sovereignty of countries that were once part of the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, the British government is set to unveil a new legislation that could lead to a crackdown on Silicon Valley. Big tech firms such as Google and Meta Platforms face more oversight and fines of up to 10 percent of global sales for practices that hurt consumers. The legislation would create a digital markets unit in the UK's antitrust regulator. Verizon reported first quarter profit and broadband subscriber gains that beat estimates and that helped offset a larger than expected loss of mobile phone customers. The overall subscriber gains mark what could be a turning point for Verizon's consumer business. It struggled the last two years and fallen behind AT&T and T-Mobile in wireless growth. And job cuts are on the way at 3M. The Minnesota-based manufacturer plans to eliminate 6,000 jobs as part of a wider restructuring. The cuts are expected to save up to $900 million. 3M posted quarterly earnings at beat estimates. Sales fell less than expected. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
If you look at market pricing, it's essentially a probability weighted you know, view of the world, right? And so the Fed cutting 25, 50 basis points before the end of the year, there's a much higher probability that the Fed's going to cut 100 basis points if there is an accident or cut zero if inflation is sticky. And so what you see in market pricing is a weighted average of that. Ed Howe is saying there of Columbia Threadneedle, to put it simply, we've either priced too many rate cuts or not enough. He's not the only one saying that. We've also heard that from Gershon Distenfad of Alliance Bernstein <coughs> and Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro. That's a theme for later on. The theme right now, earnings. Let's talk about the market more broadly on the S&P 500. Softer throughout this morning, negative 0.5%. UPS a little bit earlier on this morning missing with some expectations at least saying annual sales will come in at the low end of guidance as US retail sales slow that stock is negative in the pre-market 3M doing a little bit better off the back of some job cuts 6,000 jobs to go over at 3M potentially so that's the latest news for them a little bit later after the close we'll hear from Microsoft we'll hear from Google the bright spot as well though Tom came from GM General Motors GM yeah. this morning a beat and a raise. The stock is up by a little more than 3% in early trading. The quality story is a transition from fuel to EV, which is, of course, the focus of the industry. I know John and Lisa have a few questions on Tesla, uh, to say the least. Joining us now, the gentleman from Auburn, Paul Jacobson, joins us, Chief Financial Officer at General uh, Motors. Paul, you drive the Hummer EV. It clocks in at $85,000, marked up to the proper Paul Jacobson level. It's maybe, oh, 104, 95,000, whatever it is. The answer is you boosted the range on a 9,000-pound vehicle. Does America want that? Is there real demonstrable evidence that broad America wants to drive EV? Well, good morning, Tom and, and, and Lisa and John. Thanks so, so, so much for having me. First of all, let me say thanks to, uh, to the GM team for an excellent quarter and uh, the confidence that we have going into the year. You know, when we're, when we're looking at EVs, you know, we, we have really strong demand for everything that we've produced so far. And, and when you look at the, uh, the order backlogs and the ramp up of uh, cell capacity, we feel good about our ability to ratchet up production to meet that demand. But, you know, consumers are speaking uh, with their commitments to us. And, uh, and we feel good about the products and the, the vehicles right. that we're producing. The Hummer EV is just a, it's a great vehicle engineered by our team. Here and, we go. Uh, and customers can't get it fast enough. Uh, you know, I, I look at this, Paul, and it is unit and price. Mr. Musk is playing with price, it seems like, on a weekly basis at Tesla. How do, I was talking to our David Welch in Detroit. It's real simple. How do you adapt to Tesla's price strategy? Is it something you react to? Is it something you ignore? So we, we've actually been very consistent with our pricing on our EVs, and that's really a function of the demand that we've seen um, for them. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of industry noise around pricing um, all across the world, and it's something that uh, we've been very consistent with, uh, with our strategy, and it's one that consumers are responding to. Over the long term, obviously, we've got a competitor that is uh, posting really strong results, really strong margins. We need to make sure that we lower our costs, especially our structural costs, and we're aggressively getting after that. We announced a $2 billion program. Uh, today, we're talking about being at the high end of that range um, in 2023, getting uh, about a billion dollars out uh, this year with the other billion to follow next year. And it's just the first step in the process of making sure that we're competitive for the next generation. Does cost savings means lay mean layoffs? Um, we're actually not doing any layoffs, Lisa. So we, uh, at the end of the day, we had a voluntary severance program. We had over 5,000 of our um, colleagues uh, opt either to retire or to, to move on. And uh, that, that alone is going to save us about a billion dollars in the run rate. And that's something that we think we can uh, manage through and, and hit our goals on our $2 billion program. You reported uh, full-year expectations, Paul, that exceeded uh, what a lot of people were anticipating. How much does this hinge on North America and not on China? How much is this completely independent of an international story and very much U.S.-focused? Well, the, the, the bulk of our business is obviously in our North America segment, and we had a really strong quarter there. Uh, pricing is, is still up as, uh, as we see wholesale prices are still lapping 
the increases we had last year that we put through as a result of the higher input costs. Uh, and demand still remains strong. So our, our volumes were up about 4%. Um, our inventories were flat, and I think the team's doing a very good job of managing through that. Um, we've, we've planned for the year, and we, we alluded to this in our guidance at the beginning of the year, that we were assuming a 15 million uh, unit uh, market uh, here in the U.S., and uh, we came in slightly above that. Uh, but, you know, we've got some cushion built in in case we see um, demand start to fall off uh, in our expectations. But when you look at our first quarter outperformance uh, and the confidence of our cost reduction plan, uh, we felt comfortable raising the guide. Now, China, obviously yeah. very competitive. They're still coming out of, uh, coming out of COVID, and uh, we see demand recovering, but it's also an incredibly competitive market. The team there has done a great job. Uh, we were able to maintain profitability in Q1, um, but we think second quarter is going to be a little bit challenging, and then we'll start to see some improvement in the back half of the year. Given how exposed you are to the U.S. market, Paul, what is your concern level in terms of tightening credit? We talk all about smaller banks and restricting uh, credit on the margins, in particular when it comes to auto lending. Are you seeing that already? How aware are you of that? We, we haven't seen that affecting our consumers and our customers. Um, and, uh, you know, we obviously have a captive financing arm through GM Financial. Um, their credit statistics, we look at them uh, every week, and uh, they're, still, um, they're still quite strong. Uh, we've seen a little bit of normalization, but uh, really back to kind of pre-COVID levels, but nothing that we've seen uh, that gives us any area of concern right now for our consumers. Paul, you've got a familiarity with Auburn, Alabama. And I see in Auburn, there's 62 public charging stations, but only six are free EV charging stations. Does General Motors have to provide leadership and set up a grid of electric charging stations across America? So this is an area that we, we got out to an early start on, Tom, as we started to build out that network. And we think it's an important uh, piece for EV adoption uh, across the country for sure. Uh, but we committed about $750 million to a multi-pronged charging strategy. Uh, the leading piece of it was a, a partnership with Pilot Flying J to help increase the uh, interstate system for road trip charging across the board. Um, but we also partner with our dealers in local communities uh, to locate chargers for, the, for those uh, families that may not have one in their home. Uh, and really, we, we, we feel like we need to provide solutions for, for everyone across the board. But, you know, paid charging is actually something that uh, that's, uh, I've found is far more economical than, uh, than even filling up your car with gas. So it's something that uh, ultimately we're committed to. What are you going to do on the dividend? I'm absolutely fair. I've, I've, I've been talking about use of cash right now. I got a gross yield of 1%. I'm not even sure what dividend growth is. Describe the five year dividend growth forward for General Motors. So we, we look at our dividend as an important part of our capital allocation um, uh, priorities. Uh, you know, the first one is obviously investing in the business. We have a lot of capital uh, that, uh, that we are um, investing for the, for the transformation, 11 to $13 billion this year uh, alone. Um, but we're still generating really sizable amounts of free cash, and that's a testament to both the team as well as the demand for our products across the board. Um, this past quarter, we repurchased about $365 million of stock while also uh, early retiring $1.5 billion of debt. So taking care of the balance sheet, being uh, prudent with our capital across the board, and a dividend is a part of that. Uh, but uh, we also uh, are actively using share repurchases as a tool to return capital to shareholders. Have you noticed how much more comfortable CFOs are, Tom, when they beat and race? <laughs> yeah. Have you noticed that? It's just, Everything's it's just, just calmer. His, his voice changes. It's just, I mean, okay, it's, just, it's calmer. Yeah, it's, cal yeah. it's, it's calmer. Like Paul Jacobson, it's, thank it's you, sir. It's a better day for sure. For sure. General Motors, <laughs> CFO, the stock is up this morning by something like 3%. TK. I, got, I got eight ways to go here, but I'm going to go to, you know, they're doing the financing of the, the vehicles and all that. How many people know that General Motors is 71% debt? They're, they're, you know, I don't think we know that. It's not like an equity juggernaut. It's run by debt, and they have to manage it. And that's what Mr. Jacobson does. And they're working at a time when there still is incredible amount of demand for expensive vehicles by wealthy individuals who can pay with cash. And that has been the divergence. How do you cater to those individuals at a time when, on the credit side, you are seeing signs of tightening? If wealthy individuals can afford it, why are we still subsidizing it? 
at the government level? For electric vehicles, you mean? Sure. Yeah, well, this is a great question. A lot of people are wondering sensitive, about that. Sensitive, but issue. how do you accelerate the move to EVs at a time when well, the government isn't more into it? This is the, one of the big conundrums. You know, I, quickly, I had the road and track headline up there. You go 355 miles in the EV that Paul and Lisa have, and the answer is you got to recharge it. Where's the recharging station when you get to... 342 miles. A lot of people have them in their homes now. You know yeah. That? yeah. Yeah. It's like a thing. Very it's like, cool. it's tough in park in the Hummer. It's tough park in the Hummer EV in Manhattan. You think? Yeah, well, Lisa has to deal with it every day. <laughs> oh, I have one. We really don't know how deep of a economic correction we're going to have. Will it be mild? Will it be more severe? We believe we're still in a bear market, a mixed market. We think we've seen the worst of it. The big question here is what is global growth going to do? We do think that the second quarter we definitely will see some negative readings. Have we pushed out a slow, shallow recession into 2024 or are we going to not get the pickup at the back half of the year that we're looking for? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, an exceptionally busy Tuesday in the middle of earnings and on to next week in Apple. We'll do that here in a moment. But the sell side speaks, and John, they speak on FRC this morning. Yeah, First Republic not doing well in the pre-market, down 22%. City had it put under review back in March. The rating was neutral, now cut to sell. The price target's 11 in the pre-market, trading in and around 12. The news from First Republic after the close just not great at all. If you look at deposits, they plunged 41% in the first quarter. This was the number, 104.5 billion. This was the number that analysts were looking for, 137. That's even after the big banks parked 30 billion there. If you want a glimmer of hope, the good news is that apparently <coughs> deposits stabilised from the end of the first quarter to where we are right now. But ultimately, if you do an earnings call and you don't take questions after the march that they just had, I don't think many of these analysts are going to be too happy, or investors for that matter as well. And I think we're seeing that reflected, Tom, in the stock, down more than 20%. Lisa, you wonder how it redounds over to the other smaller banks, not the regionals, not the super regionals, but buffeted by commercial real estate, buffeted by different challenges. I think there's been a not a lack of transparency, but just there's a there's an opaqueness to it, right? Well, John now. has been saying earlier that we've gotten a whole host of regional banks and we haven't gotten any massive surprises. On some level, First Republic kind of was that shock where you saw that it was even worse than people expected and that they really don't have answers to a lot of the very difficult questions that people would have otherwise asked. I mean, what other uh, conclusion could you possibly draw? So this raises an issue of, OK, what about everybody else? Were their earnings really as rock solid as seemed to be represented by the lack of any further decline, sort of like what we saw at First Republic? But today we are seeing them fall yeah. in sympathy. News extraordinary this morning. And we'll do that with the economic data today, particularly on housing. On the data front, John, I'm looking at SPX. I'm just looking at S&P futures. And, you know, negative 21, negative 22. Then they come back and they just, they're just they vacillating off of wheat guidance and also some constructive earnings reports as well. Yeah, today the price action has been constructive at the index <coughs> level, particularly on the NASDAQ, because of a handful of names. And you're going to get the earnings from those handful of names starting after the close today with Google and Microsoft, tomorrow Facebook, Thursday Amazon, next week Apple. The focus shifts, Tom. You know the arc of earnings season starts yeah. with the banks, then you move to tech pretty quickly, and we will do later. We will focus on that this morning. We have a wonderful guest with it that John's going to bring in. But, you know, John, it's going to be important. Newberger Berman is going to focus today on the 4 p.m. earnings. Thursday on the 4 p.m. earnings. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, every set there will be shifted from financial media over to Manchester City Arsenal. Are you it, saying that Charles is this game? won't be watching Meta He will earnings. not be watching Meta earnings uh, tomorrow. How big a game is that tomorrow that's going to distract this, Global Wall Street? We call this a six-pointer, don't we, Charles? Epic. It's a six-pointer. How big is this for Arsenal, for the Gunners? It's huge. I was at Highbury when I was four. Um, so I have a Were you really? I really was. My dad was teaching at the London School of Economics, and he dragged me along to Highbury. And um, I'm super excited about Wednesday. So we'll have the three Broombrook screens going, and one will have the match on, and the rest <laughs> will have meta earnings. I had to say to Tom on Friday, when they were throwing the game against Southampton away, I said to Tom, you need to understand the phrase bottling it. Are they bottling it? They choke in a little. 
um, it's tough to lead the whole year from the front, and um, it's been remarkable. And we'll it, we'll know tomorrow. We'll know tomorrow. Top of the league, Arsenal going up against Manchester City, the top two, the face down tomorrow. So you won't be watching meta earnings. I imagine you'll be looking at Google and Microsoft a little bit later. These tech names have had massive moves here today. Lisa talked about Meta up something like 70 to 80 percent so far in 2023. Are you expecting the numbers to validate the moves? Uh, for, for, I think the two stories this afternoon will be a little different. Microsoft's going to be all about Azure and the enterprise slowing. Um, and uh, the, the large enterprise companies have, have all kind of looked at their cloud spend and decided to rationalize a little bit. Um, but then on Microsoft, it's 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 going to be telling the long long term story around um, open AI and their forty nine percent investment there. We've done the math on on some of that. The math's not easy. Op you know the AI market will be over a trillion dollar market in by twenty thirty, and and Microsoft's magnificently positioned there and um, can add at least maybe twenty percent to their to to their top line over the next five to six years. So I think Microsoft is going to be. Uh, you're going to look through the valley to the to the next peak, so to speak. Kind of ignore the shorter term headwinds and and focus more on the longer term opportunity. Where Google, I think it's it's they haven't provided the sizzle that Microsoft has as it relates to OpenAI. So I think there we're looking for a lot of clarity around their longer term strategy. I think they magnificently positioned there as well. Um, but unlike Microsoft, we're going to be thinking through um, efficiency. And optimization as it relates to their to their cost structure, they they sell at two vastly different valuations. The point I'd make, maybe more generally about technology that maybe sometimes gets gets lost, the by and large the resiliency you've seen in earnings out of the out of the index, so to speak, is because these businesses have magnificent income statement flexibility, and um, the challenge with the financial companies is they. They don't have income statement flexibility. They are tied by their balance sheets. And so I am quite optimistic that the very large index contributors will, will deliver earnings that are of high quality, um, and they're protecting, they're protecting their cash flows this year. The market shifted, as you know, from revenue to what matters, which is cash in the bank. Which they have magnificently displayed. Will OpenAI be the new blockchain? I mean, basically, have we already fully priced in just saying chat GPT and then seeing your stock soar? I, I don't think we have. And I certainly haven't at Microsoft. And we certainly haven't at Google because Google sells at 10 times EV to enterprise value. That, that is not a valuation that suggests a lot of good news is priced in. I like the analogy to, the, to, to blockchain. We think the, the efficiency opportunity for people that adopt AI is is 2x on the margin line relative to the blockchain. Mm. So we're talking if you thought blockchain was a was a 200 basis points improvement to efficiency for companies adopting it, we think open AI is probably 500 mm. basis points. Think through the efficiency of that and think through the productivity. I want to focus on your courage to own a few things, own a big. You were down, I believe, 24% last year in one portfolio. Yep. Maybe that was a little worse than others because you had big tech owning. I want to talk about the street focus on that these stocks are too big, too dominant, and people are diversifying away. Peter Lynch called it diversification. In general, are people diversifying away where they should own more of big tech? It's it's a it's a Big question we have, the, the growth strategy, um, our large cap growth strategy that was down 24% last year, we felt great relative to the large cap growth indices. I think it proved out the high quality defensive right. nature of how we you know, proceed with growth. I think I gave you the analogy with, 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 with Microsoft. Here's a company that can add um, you know, 20 to $30 billion dollars to their revenues over the next five years, and they're running at $200 billion dollars of revenue today. Um, I don't know many companies that, that can operate at that scale with that type of opportunity. And I think when you think through, when you think through Google, the challenge there is going to be, can, it's a little bit of the innovator's dilemma. Can they, can they um, understand the threat that AI provides to their core search business, which is kind of a 92% monopoly business, while capturing the opportunity of AI, not different to how Netflix kind of attacked themselves as they went from you know, physical delivery of content to digital. 
Um, and and you've, got to, you've got to factor in valuation. Look, in this environment, um, I think you've got to quality up. You've got to own income statement flexibility. You've got to be mindful of the balance sheet. And you've got to own businesses that, if the tide was to go out, you feel really good about their next three to five year positioning. And, and I think you just find that today in the large companies that are, that are going to be massive beneficiaries of all the compute spend that's going to take place with AI. Microsoft's magnificently positioned. So is Google. So is Amazon. So is um, Meta. These folks own the largest computers in the world, and they're going to rent them out to everyone else, and everyone else is going to enjoy a 500 basis point margin improvement over time. And that's going to be very good for, for, for the economy. It's going to come with lots of headwinds, no doubt. Um, lots of regulatory scrutiny for sure, but 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 net net it's a, it's 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 massive. I didn't hear LVMH or MS up in quality. That's all we're hearing about Europe, luxury players, yeah. all of that good stuff. I mean, why are you not there? I think I mean we we're not there necessarily with that specific wonderful high end retailer. My wife's there um, in, <laughs> spades. Sure. Sure. in spades. I'm um, sure in We were recently in Europe and. Um, there is a currency hedge, so to, you know, currency <laughs> arbitrage, so to speak. So I'm familiar with the power of that brand. They built a remarkable company. They've got to go through, a, you know, they've got to figure out which of the five favorite kids are, are going to run, sure. run the show. But I think this morning from Pepsi and McDonald's, you saw what quality and innovation and convenience and value delivers to, to the Only consumer. Only Charles Cantor can segue from Lewis Vuitton to, to sell the other half, Pepsi and McDonald's. <laughs> I know Good less luck. about McDonald's as a consumer. For both, all of that, right? But it's just quality, and, and yeah. so... <laughs> yeah, LVMH, McDonald's. In the, it, it, it's a function of who the consumer is. I mean, the consumer yeah. at McDonald's sees tremendous value, as does, as does the LVMH customer in a different way. You were acclaimed on Whole Foods Amazon. Whole Foods is now thrown in the towel. They're going to go low price, lower price. Is it going to work? I don't know if they're going to do that precisely. Um, in your honor, I was back there on, on Saturday just buying a few things for dinner. Um, look, they have made wholesome food affordable um, for all of America. You know, what gets lost with, with Amazon is they now have relationships with 3,000 local producers. That's way up from when Whole Foods was a standalone company. And yeah. if you're a prime member, right. you're getting value with so Whole Foods. So you were Dior to uh, I don't Whole know about Foods. you, but when I go into Whole Foods to get dinner, I could have bought an Hermes scarf. It's not perfectly cheap but it hasn't sure. it hasn't come down that That's much kind. relative yeah. to <laughs> I've got when 15 it was. seconds you pay for quality do you miss Highbury I do miss Highbury and I haven't yet been to Emirates so I've been to the Emirates a couple of times uh, my guess is the seating at at the Emirates is a little It'd bit nice more comfortable than Highbury it's on those old stadiums I think of Fenway and Boston yeah Wrigley you know just the romance of it it's great I wish they'd kept them maybe Charles Cantor can talk to Mr. Levy Cantor's got you know Cantor's got the mask to help Tottenham parachute in and parachute in and run consult. Spurs I'm not sure Spurs are quality right now Tom yeah, yeah, well that's a Charles big Cantor, debate thank you sir great Newberg to see Berman. everyone so equity futures negative 0.5 percent this is Bloomberg keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word I'm Lisa Mateo in the news this morning, President Biden asking voters to let him, quote, finish this job. The president has formally announced that he would seek re-election next year. In a video released today, he said there is still work to do to give Americans a fair shot. The president criticized what he called extremists in the Republican Party who want to cut government spending and curb abortion rights. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is refusing requests from fellow Republicans to change his $1.5 trillion debt ceiling proposal. Bloomberg's learned the bill will be sent to the floor for a vote this week under a rule that does not allow amendments. If as few as five Republicans oppose the measure, it would be defeated. Halliburton posted its strongest first quarter profit in more than a decade. The world's biggest provider of fracking services said the outlook for oil drilling is bright. That's the opposite of its rivals who predict an imminent slowdown. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
we still like the tech sector because certainly uh, the understanding that there's a lot of inventory to be worked off. The question is, can they have a decent results in the markets uh, really go down because of that? We think we'd rather ride that out and say these companies have long-term growth, they have good positions in their industry, strong balance sheets to withstand, even if we do have a deep recession. Looking ahead to big tech after the close, that was Margie Vital of Allspring Global Investments. Looking ahead to Google, Microsoft a little bit later on this evening after the closing bell in New York. Then on to Meta tomorrow, on to Thursday, to Amazon, on to next week on May 4th. Apple earnings just around the corner. Coming into all of that, your equity market negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. I've said once and then on repeat in a promo that you might have heard a few times that there hasn't been a shocker yet until maybe, as Lisa indicated, maybe that shocker came after the close from somewhere that it should have been expected to come from. First Republic is down by 22% in the pre-market deposits. <clears throat> to see deposits plunging 41% in the first quarter and so much of that seemingly coming in the month of March. To see analysts looking for a number close to 140 and Lisa getting a number close to $100 billion in deposits, that's a major disappointment for this bank. That's putting it mildly. The fact that they didn't, as you both pointed out, take any questions in the press conference at a time when people are wondering about the future of this uh, bank, whether it's viable even as a standalone entity tells you volumes. <clears throat> How much does this really speak, though, to the fundamental challenge for regional banks that we has not fully been priced in? That's what a lot of people think, this idea that they're going to have to pay up for deposits. They don't have those cheap deposits. They're going to have to withdraw some loans. And oh, by the way, their earnings are right. not going to be particularly I, positive. I'm going to parse the 22 banks of the Keith Briette uh, and Woods Index here, the BKX Index. You mentioned the regionals, Lisa. There's super regionals. There's regionals. There's small banks across this nation. And then there's marketing plans. And I'm, I don't bunch First Republic with any of those other banks. It was a marketing concept run awry when interest rates went up. I just don't, they're not a regional to me. There's an issue with respect to idiosyncratic risk and a question about the management teams of some of these banks. And then there's this issue of free money is over. Deposits that were cheap are no longer. And so all of a sudden, you have to figure out a new value proposition for firms that benefited during an era where that was just a given, that kind of yeah. cheap finance. I would suggest all of 3M, the new value proposition is cut costs. 6,000 jobs I, to I go think, there, yeah. And, and, and we saw it with FRC as well. As we lean forward with Charles Cantor here of Newberger Berman, we do better with RBC Capital Markets, Rishi Jaluria. Now, he's a software equity analyst. Forget about it. Expert on Microsoft. Here we go, folks, on the big stock you don't own. Rishi, 26% per year total return over the last 10 years. The free cash flow blowout pre-pandemic is absolutely stunning. I mean, the cash flow growth out five years to a model 2024 is off the chart. Is the story priced into the stock now, or will there be constructive surprises forward? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, I think the, the big story around Microsoft, if we put maybe the near-term macro aside, is really AI. And, and as we've outlined, we really think the opportunity with generative AI for Microsoft is a call option on the stock. It is not priced in today. Uh, we, we actually need to make money off Microsoft stock absent any AI story, but really that's where you right. get the next leg of growth up. And, and, and I do not think that's priced in. You know, if you think about all the different ways throughout Microsoft's portfolio that can that it can benefit from uh, generative AI, be it in, in Azure from their agreement with OpenAI, be it uh, competitively uh, with the Microsoft 365 suite and, and the integration of Copilot throughout, be it in their security, be it in, in GitHub. I think there's so many ways Microsoft can benefit from generative AI, and I think right. that's the next leg of growth up here. Arisha, I want to go to that. Okay, the free cash flow numbers, folks, is $38 billion pre-pandemic, and they went out to $73 billion, modeled out for 224. That's the existing company with 200,000 employees. Rishi, explain how AI is different than other new things, the, brute, the bright, shiny new concept, and that it's a call option on Microsoft that has real durability. Yeah, I mean, I, look, this is a the, the the fourth big technological change in, in, in my lifetime, right? Going back to you, the internet, 
going back to uh, mobility, the cloud, and, and now AI. And you know, I know we've been talking about AI for so long, but ChatGPT was that watershed moment that gets AI widespread throughout the ecosystem. This is like when Netscape for the internet came out or, or, or the iPhone for mobility. Um, and that is where we really think this has so much potential, not just for, for revenue, but, but to your point on, on the bottom line for free cash flow uh, for Microsoft, that we can see that number continue to move up. And because of Microsoft's first mover advantage because of how far ahead of others open AI is, and because of how quickly every other company is having to move to have a generative AI strategy, we believe Microsoft will be an outsized beneficiary of that. And, and if you look out throughout the entire portfolio of Microsoft's products, um, all the growth rates will be significantly different. Everyone's going to be talking about Azure growth rates. And, and you know, it, it seeming, it's realistic to me that that's going to decelerate to probably 20% growth over the coming quarters. But if once you start layering in the benefits from generative AI, uh, because this is so much more resource intensive, um, not to mention you'll probably have an entire trillion dollar economy built on uh, open AI, just like you had a trillion dollar economy with the iPhone and a trillion dollar economy with AWS. I think that Azure number goes back above 30% growth. Rishi, how much smaller can some of these uh, big tech companies be on a headcount level based on some of the efficiencies that everyone keeps talking about with artificial intelligence? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. I would say, you know, number one for Microsoft, I, I think in contrast to a lot of the other big tech, they didn't over hire at the same rate. I know they they have done a riff. Uh, some of that was was eliminating underperforming employees. Some of that was was actual cost savings and reallocating of employees. But I'd say Microsoft maybe had more responsible hiring practices and a lot of other big tech companies that have had to do significantly bigger riffs. Um, and if you benchmark their employee efficiency relative to other companies' enterprise software, they're, they're, they were very high, even even prior to the RIF. Um, now, in terms of the cost savings from generative AI, I think that's a big open-ended question. Um, you know, we, we can talk about innovation and, and what generative AI brings there, but there is also, it, it, it makes developers significantly more effective. It makes marketers more effective, salespeople more effective. And I wouldn't be surprised if we could see a, a company be able to get away with significantly lower headcount. I'm talking double digit, right? 10% plus lower headcount uh, as a result of really embracing and leveraging generative AI on the back end. And, um, you know, that's maybe more of a three-year story than, than a near-term one. But absolutely, every company I'm, I, I talk to is trying to use generative AI for greater operational efficiency. efficiency. And then I think the terminal margins across enterprise software and, and really across big tech has to be higher long-term now because of this. Just real quick here, who's going to win the generative AI game? Will it be Google or will it be Microsoft? Yeah, it's, it's, it's early to tell, but I think Microsoft has such a huge lead uh, from their early investment in OpenAI, from the fact that OpenAI is an arm's length transaction. You look at the advantages you have in ChatGPT versus all the other systems out there, including uh, Bard and Claude and, and, and any others that have been out there. I think Microsoft has a huge advantage and it is theirs to lose. Rishi, great to get your perspective on a key story a little bit later on this afternoon. Rishi Deluri there of RBC. TK, you know the history of this. It has been amazing to see what Microsoft has become over the last 20 years. My brother has a hard drive from Sun Microsystems 40 years ago nailed to a wall of his house out in Utah. This is what he said the other day. Chat GPT and AI is game changing like nothing in 30 years. He's in the trenches of this, writing code, doing what Rishi's talking about. I was stunned when I heard that. He's not one to say that. I was looking at a study that showed the top professions that would be replaced by ChatGPT and uh, open AI. And I think uh, journalist was number 45. So I think uh, of 700. <laughs> He's so talking I was saying to myself, okay, that's good. I've got let, a couple more years. Let's what we just heard from Rishi <laughs> with Charles Cantor. Cantor's talking about a 200 to 500 beep pickup in margin. And what my brother's saying, the electrical engineer, is it's the grind of coding is where you see those efficiencies, not like what's it going to do to journalists or, you know, English football players. We're all learning about the difference between you and your brother. Oh, yeah. Every, every, every day, Tom. Straight A's. I've never seen no. this before. No, it's like, it's, it, seriously, the difference between me and my brother, straight A's, not. <laughs> Coming up next hour, Keith Lerner, mm. Luke Hickmore, Katie Kaminsky.
Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Lisa Abramowitz and Tom King. John Farrell preparing for the next eventful hour into these tech earnings. Just great. Lisa, I thought it was great to have Charles Cantor and Rishi there from RBC Capital Markets back to back on the ginormousness of all these stocks we wish we owned more of. Well, exactly. I mean, this idea that you're, there's going to be a sea change in technology that's going to generate massive growth, massive investment, massive efficiency in chat GPT or the broader open AI kind of infrastructure. This doesn't really pair with this sort of moody, gloomy feel of an economy destined for recession. And so pair those ideas as sort of the preeminence of certain technologies with an underlying fear of a softening of the consumer. I mean, and again, the softening here, and David Rosenberg had it with a tweet as we go to our next wonderful guest here about this the quality of our economics in the first quarter and what it means for strategy with futures at negative 17. Laura Rame right now, chief U.S. economist, FS Investments. A lot of people are, including Mr. Rosenberg, are talking about how January was bang up and we're already into our economic slowdown. We hear that within the guidance of corporate earnings, selected uh, guidance, I should say. Are we into our slowdown? We're still in a slower growth environment. And I say that only because remember that outside of the pandemic boom or post pandemic boom, our potential growth rate is around one and three quarters. I think that's where we're settling one and a half in the second quarter. And the consumer still has so much momentum behind it. You look at the fact that Yes, the wealth drawdown, the savings drawdown continues, but I think if we've seen anything, it's that deposit levels broadly are still relatively high. And that means that with jobs still broadly plentiful, outside of tech, I want to be clear, there have been some distressing layoff announcements, but jobs remain plentiful. It's what we're looking at the most closely, but right now it's way too soon to call for a recession. This idea of a recession, if I get a growth rate, and I want you to give me your growth rate for it, if it's under 2%, to me that's germane. If we have a 1% or 1.4% all bundled in growth rate, isn't that a recession for a lot of Americans? It doesn't feel good. One of the big conversations that we're having is the fact that we're seeing sluggish growth rates, but still really significant and robust job ads. And most of those new jobs are going to still these sort of lower productivity service sector jobs. I think productivity is extremely low right now. And that's what makes it feel like such a grind. But this is really the difference between sluggish growth. We've had plenty of periods. Remember 2015, 16, you know, we basically had an earnings recession, but we didn't have a growth recession. You get periods of sluggish growth that don't check all the boxes of recession. It doesn't mean they're great, and it doesn't mean that they're easy investing landscapes. I think you bring up a really important point about the forward guidance we're getting from companies. You know, earnings estimates going forward are still flat. I mean, they've come down a lot, but the forward 12 month is still uh, at net net flat. That's not a recessionary outlook. In recessions, earnings historically fall 10% at least. I'm struck by everyone talking about this bifurcation or just splintering in terms of the fates of different sectors. And you were kind of, before we got on air, talking about this as an 18-wheeler and the Fed's just pumping the brakes on two of the wheels and then everything else keeps grinding along. And I wonder if we're going to look back, yes, as a grind when it comes to uh, just growth numbers overall, but a real transition moment for this economy where it sort of accelerates the gap between the haves and the have-nots, whether it's individuals or whether it's companies, the large ones with pricing power, those that are going to get subsumed or go out of business. How much are we at a tipping point that will rearrange the structure of this economy? I, I think, Elisa, I think we're already there. I think if you look at the Cap, the share of capital going to labor, it's actually already increased. You know, we've already seen globalization really wipe that out significantly, and we've bounced pretty significantly. I think when you look at the breadth of the market rally that we've seen, it's so narrow and it's so narrowly focused on these large cap tech companies. It makes the pressure on the earnings this coming week very acute. And I think beyond that, you know, look at the whole issue that the Fed is having with inflation, the wages that the historically sort of commoditized service industry is able to garner is really rising. 
you know, it's not necessarily yeah. good for profits going forward, but I think we have to acknowledge that maybe we had kind of stretched the rubber band of inequality so much that it is rebounding to some degree. I don't think that's all bad. The creative destruction, Lisa, I thought your question was just brilliant. Let's go back a few years, like think 1982, 1970, Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Westinghouse Electric Corporation, a company called Eastman Kodak Company, Union Carba, Inco Limited, and others, Goodyear Tire. I mean, the, I, I think what you brilliantly asked about in the, the superiority of technology is just American corporate history. It's but just that simple. I, I would agree. And pair that with the sort of right-sizing of imbalances that have been created over all of this time. Laura, you mentioned how a lot of lower-wage workers kind of getting more power in a sense, that the, the, the power is shifting back to labor to demand more for their services. We got the results from McDonald's. We got the results from PepsiCo and Coca-Cola. And we can see that actually they are still able to pass along the price increases to consumers. How much is this a story that runs out of time? And how much is this possible because of that power of labor, a basic stickiness to an ability to pay more. Well, and I think add on to that, the fact that um, when we look at these companies, the big tech companies right now, <laughs> they're growing by expanding into each other's lanes for the first time in a long yeah. while. You know, they're very mature companies. And, you know, unlike before where it was only focused on growth, I think now they're having to kind of cannibalize each other as they grow. And, you know, Lisa, to your point, you know, the, the data point this week that I think is garnering so much attention for me is initial claims. You know, we've seen the tech layoffs. Let's see how it expands right. to the broader economy, because right now I hear companies were still working to retain labor, not just right. like it looking to shed. Laura, more than any other chief U.S. economist I know, you've enjoyed the trenches of foreign exchange study. How does a dollar fit into the dynamics to 2024. Weak dollar, strong dollar, do we overestimate dollar movement? I think a lot of people right now are watching closely to see if the dollar weakens further from here. It's weakened significantly over the last year, yeah. but still, if you look at a long run view, <clears throat> it's relatively strong. I think that the humdrum around the dollar's uh, less, you know, weaker status as a reserve currency is getting a lot of attention. And to me, that's one of the unspoken background stories of the strategic chess match, which is going on right now globally. So what is your run rate for GDP? I mean, 12 months out, all in GDP. I think it's something our audience, with all the narratives Lisa's talked about, we've really lost scale of. What is your statistic for real GDP out 12 months? 1% growth over entirety of 2023. I think we hit negative 0.5% in the third quarter, negative 1.5% in the first quarter, and then we bounce from there. I think it is a recession, but I do think it is more mild. And that's because these big companies are needing to invest. When you talk about some of the larger companies cannibalizing from each other, do you think that we're going to get, I know that Tom always talks about monopsony, are we going to get basically oligarchies in every industry? Yeah. Is that going to be how we emerge from this period? I, I mean, I think you could argue that we're already there, but it is something that America does well. It's destroy our oligarchs. I think, you know, I remember 15 years ago, we just talked about Walmart and how every single earnings cycle, they just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then Amazon came along. I mean, you know, look back at history. It's rife with companies that really expand and blow our minds with innovation. And then 20 years later, they've been toppled by the next new thing. So, you know, are these the companies that are that are able to innovate and stay ahead of that? I think they're great companies. I just think that they're trading at two their P ratios are too high right now. So as Tom mentioned, I've been a little bit all over the place today. I've been really interested in a number of different themes. And we keep going back to the one that's underpinning so much of what's going on economically, which is inflation. And we kind of hinted at it with respect to uh, labor's power. And when is that going to wane? When we emerge from this, will it be to a higher inflationary regime based on that shift back to labor? I'm going to add more nuance and say that I think we end the year with inflation that's uncomfortably high, around 4%. But I do think that, of course, we will face periods of lower inflation. I think that the 25-year low inflation, low volatility inflation episode is over. And going forward, 
We're in a period of higher volatility inflation, less ability to yeah. control inflation through globalization. And I think it means it implies more volatile monetary policy cycles. Laura Ram, thank you so much with FS Investments. Lisa, as the president was announcing his reelection, the head of IR for Pepsi Cola was going, How dare you do that? Out came Pepsi the moment President Biden talked about a reelection attempt. I don't think we gave it enough love. Forget about 12% organic revenue. Frito Lay, this is potato chips. And thank, you. thank you. I'm you. fully aware I have. Up 16% organic revenue growth. Joe Weisenthal of Odlots makes the. Uh, uh, a statement here, it's all about pricing power, which Jack Welch never dreamed of. They can raise prices. We talked yesterday about shrinkflation, shrink the amount that you actually get and continue to sell. And this really raises this conundrum. Where is that weakness? If you can see Pepsi with their pricing power, you see McDonald's with their pricing power, you see Coca-Cola with their pricing power. Charles Cantor talking about quality and how that's there is quality there for the consumer in and each sector. But to me, how long can they continue to do this? Well, that's the question. It's an arch question. Question, and the optimist would say Apple, Microsoft, PepsiCo, whatever, they can continue to do it. What's fascinating here, and this goes back to some people are alluding back to the, the nifty 50 of the 60s and that. To your point on monopoly and this odd thing, monopsony, which is a different concept, those two ideas lead to concentration. And I wonder if the theme a year from now or two years from now is just going to be mass concentration of selected successful companies. That's I wonder if that's where we're heading to. And Laura was saying we're already there. That's what you're yeah. seeing right now. So what about that zombie roll-up, right? When do we see the others sort of take it out of business? <clears throat> well, and that, I think, we're starting to see. I mean, the fact that Bed Bath & Beyond is closing all of their stores, uh, the fact that David's Bridal will close all of their stores if they don't find a buyer, this isn't just a restructuring and a repackaging. This is a change. And Manus Cranny would say Credit Suisse is closing all of their stores. That may not be accurate, but there's different zombies out there. There's different roll-ups. What a fascinating time. On Washington, Her Washington, Henrietta Trey's next. Futures at negative 17. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Joe Biden has made it official. He's running for re-election next year. The president made his long-awaited announcement in a video today asking voters to let him, quote, finish this job. He'll face a Republican field dominated by his predecessor. Meanwhile, economic uncertainty will cloud his case for a second term. Meanwhile, the British government is set to unveil new legislation that could lead to a crackdown on Silicon Valley. Big tech firms such as Google and Meta Platforms face more oversight and fines of up to 10% of global sales for practices that hurt consumers. The legislation would create a digital markets unit in the UK's antitrust regulator. JetBlue reported first quarter operating revenue that met estimates. The carrier also reaffirmed its fiscal year earnings outlook. JetBlue says that in the second quarter, it expects strong revenue growth to continue thanks to robust demand. And General Electric posted first quarter sales profit that cash flow that was better than expected. The company also raised its annual guidance thanks to surging aerospace demand. GE wants to more than double earnings this year before separating its energy related businesses in 2024. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lise Mateo and this is Bloomberg. It's a terribly stressful job, as you know, and the fact that he could still be president at the age of 86 to me is mind boggling. But it's worth noting that Donald Trump turned 77 later this spring. So it's not as if uh, it's just one old candidate. It's two old candidates. It's 6 a.m. this morning. Gregory Vallier of AGF Investments really writing on people go, who's Greg Vallier? Why is he on? And the answer is he puts out a brilliant short note. It depends, 4 or 5 a.m. hour, maybe the 7 a.m. hour as well. 
and and Lisa, it's a, it, it, it's there's other notes like it, but he just brings in the business and finance sector into the Beltway. Like nobody, nobody and, does it. Like and that. right now, that's going to be needed more than ever at a time of such uncertainty with the economy. We we're talking just then uh, with Laura Raym about all of the strength in the economy, and then we got this data point about the Philadelphia Fed non-manufacturing uh, activity for the month of April. It came in way below expectations following yeah. on what we saw from the Dallas Fed yesterday. So this speaks to the other side of the story, and this yeah. really speaks to the politics of a moment. When how do you get reelected in an economy that's not going gangbusters? Yeah, John from Milan e emails in, and he, you know he notes that you know the market moved here two tens uh, with some movement. Real yield doesn't move much, but the two year yield four point zero three percent. You wonder, do we get a two year under four percent again? And I mean, we're swinging back. Maybe given earnings guidance as well to that kind of slowdown. But you also wonder how much volume is and how jittery people are for the Philadelphia Fed non-manufacturing activity survey for April to be moving yields this much, Tom. Well, it's going to be more economic data as well, and we'll have that through the morning new home sales here at 10 o'clock, uh, leading the way with those mortgage rates. Henrietta Trey's with us right now, Director of Economic Policy Research at VETA Partners, but par uh, far more political economic policy as well. When an election starts 560 days out, Henrietta, what's the gridlock look like? What is the new gridlock after the election is engaged? Uh, the new gridlock is basically we get this debt ceiling past us, um, hopefully in the next month or two, and then we move pretty much exclusively to China. Um, and there will be a focus on trying to craft a bipartisan bill, um, any attempt to differentiate uh, the Republicans from the Democrats on that front. And I suspect they'll both be jawboning about what could come on the China front, um, including tariffs, investment restrictions, heading into right. um, seven. That's where we'll be. So that'll be the legislative debate. But does China fold into election results? The maxim I've always uh, heard is that domestic issues are far more important in an election dash. Does China play into the election dash? I think so. Uh, you have nearly 80 percent of the U.S. population who believes that China is something of an enemy to the United States. So it's a very popular boogeyman. I think you have to question what the underlying macroeconomic data is going to look like, what's unemployment. You know, if it's still in the three and a half, even four percent range, it's not going to be that striking topic like it has been in years past. And we're at eight, nine, 10 percent. Um, if inflation has come down and it similarly is not in the 8, 9, 10 percent range, you're going to have an opportunity to focus on foreign policy uh, because domestic politics or domestic economic policy data will have uh, a cooler temperature. It won't be big enough to occupy headlines every single day. So you can have an opening for China to be a conversation. A lot of shift right now when it comes to geopolitics, a lot of shift when it comes to economics, and there's not a lot of shift when it comes to the most likely matchup for the 2024 election. It is President Biden. He is in the running. That is what he said earlier this morning with the official announcement. And former President Trump, this is the likely matchup. What does that say to you, that it's the two known entities going at it again? You know, it's really interesting. I'm trying to find a great way to say this, but as an analyst, you know, we're always looking for some sort of nuance or edge uh, to share with clients and help them have a little bit of extra juice going into any kind of a big event like this. But realistically, we have a pretty solid run rate to work with. Democrats uh, won the midterm elections in 2018 by an overwhelming majority. Uh, Democrats won the 2020 presidential election, picking up Arizona and Nevada. Um, Georgia even. We won the um, special elections in Georgia twice. And then in 2022, ran in a super high inflationary environment coming out of the pandemic in a race that Democrats had no business winning and the minority party lost in the most epic blowout since the 1930s. So it's really difficult to try to find a rationale for not knowing the outcome of the 2024 presidential election cycle. We've seen this fight literally four times now. Um, and it each at each one ends the same way. So it's difficult to find a way to explain or convince anybody, including my own brain, about how you could see Republicans win in this environment with the same candidate. How much is this Democrats winning and how much is this Republicans losing with respect to uh, where the balance of power is in that party? I, I would definitely look at the key states. I mean, all our clients know and you all know it doesn't matter what the national data is. Um, it's really about key states of the Electoral College. So look at Arizona, look at Pennsylvania um, in those states. 
Joe Biden is ahead by four points, one point. Um, and that's that's the outcome of the cycle. So you might have some scenarios where certain states are mm -hmm. going more more aggressively for Trump. Uh, but mostly it's going to be a national referendum right. in key states against the uh, Republican caucus and their uh, policies. Henry, and I brought up twice today a question of progressives or liberals within the Democratic Party. I mean, in the Republican concept, there's this idea of Republican in name only. Is Joe Biden a Democrat in name only? Um, I think that if you were to poll a Bernie Sanders or some of his uh, supporters, they would say things along those lines. But it's really difficult to look at the track record and see a $1.9 trillion CARES Act bill passed in the first month of his administration, the CHIPS Act, which was bipartisan, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and then the Inflation Reduction Act. There is establishment, Democratic, <clears throat> uh, you know, Democratic in name only agenda items right. like CHIPS and the but then there's also those progressive items, green energy tax credits that are very expansive. Um, and then obviously the $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill, uh, which had a lot of progressive agenda items in there. So Henry, it, you can make both cases. Thank you so much. Henrietta Trey's uh, director of economic policy, Veda Partners there. Uh, we've got to run because the news, the news flow today is just extraordinary. I mean, you, and Lisa, you did such a good job on the the earnings and, you know, they're like, am I right? McDonald's thumb up, UPS thumb down. I mean, it's that variance. It's that binary in terms <laughs> of what industry you're in as well. If it's physical stuff, it's harder, right? That's what we're finding. UPS, whether it's 3M, yes, yeah, their shares are up a little like bit, that. but they're yeah. uh, they're cutting 6,000 jobs. If it's stuff that you buy to eat or drink or go out and do, whether it's airlines, <clears throat> whether it's uh, McDonald's, that's doing well. And this is sort of right. how long can we continue in this sort of motley uh, progression. We're trying to continue to the surveillance nap or to Manchester City Arsenal tomorrow, and I don't know if FRC is going to participate. It is plunging, folks. That is, I, I rarely use that word, but on an intraday chart, we are at 1280, 1260, and we're doing a free fall now down under 12 to 11.88. And Suddenly, and I do with respect to all the challenge they're facing, and we don't want to be inflammatory, the sell side is voting. I saw Jenny Montgomery Scott, Citigroup adjusting. Everyone seems to be adjusting. Did they? How did they get to 4 o'clock this afternoon? Help well, me. It's a real question, and people are wondering who's going to come in and be the uh, the white knight at a time when a lot of people don't want to buy it. I will point out that PacWest, which is going to report earnings today at 4.20 p.m. Eastern, those shares lower 6% in pre-market no. trading. So you can see the sort of knock-on effect of other weak links and how much you get ongoing declines there as well. The fundamental story here is it might not be a wholesale credit collapse of contagion. This is is a fundamentally challenged business model where suddenly free money is not free and those deposits cost a lot more, potentially even more, than if you were a big bank. But there's other banks the same size that are, do, you know, relatively doing fine. It may be a changed environment, net interest margin dynamics and, and commercial real estate and that. But to me, and I don't know, what is it, Pacific what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Western Pac West. Alliance. Yeah, Western Pac Alliance, Pac Pacific West. West and yeah. the other names. They, they're different than these other banks, is what I would respectfully suggest. Sure, there are definitely idiosyncratic stories within the larger sector. The bigger economic picture, though, is that something has to give. You have to see some loans be, being pulled back in order to deal with a different funding uh, structure. So, yes, oh. perhaps not Armageddon. These are not necessarily representative, but there is a broader story here that affects more firms. They've got 5.3 million shares of FRC trading, and the bid we just popped off 11.86 on uh, FRC. So I think that's a, that's a story truly to watch. I mean, how do their executives react? We didn't hear from them yesterday in a conference call. Did they redux it today with some form of statement, and even as soon as this morning? You know what I'm guessing? I'm guessing they're on the phone right now. They're on the phone, one 800 Jamie, 1 800, <laughs> going I, around finding out. Anyone? Anyone? Anybody going to pick up the phone? Yeah. I'm not sure this <laughs> time know. around. Extraordinary day and really gives you a flavor of it through the week and onto the Apple earnings on May 4th after that Fed meeting. Microsoft this afternoon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.